What is going on, y'all? Welcome back to Steve Busa GS. I am joined by none other than the one, the only Mode Nine. How are you feeling today, my guy? Um, good, man. Tip top, tip top. I had a slight accident a week. Is it a week ago? Uh, last week, uh, I actually blew my uh my Achilles out. Bam. Uh. It was terrible. I couldn't walk for three days, two weeks ago. Couldn't work for three days, but now I'm good. Yeah, I'm limping no, around no. like a pimp, but it's all good. I'm you got me. Hundred percent. Make the most out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Glad to hear you're recovering. Um, I gotta. We we gotta go. I gotta. I gotta frame this interview with a uh, with a couple things real quick, right? First of all, I gotta thank you for taking the time to come and chop it up with me. Uh, the 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 blessing is not lost on me that I have the opportunity to sit down and chop it up with legends in a space that I've come to, to find very near and dear to my heart. It means a lot to me that you're here. And I want to start this off by just saying thank you for taking the time to come and chop it up, my guy. Yeah, man. All good. All good. Uh, the, the next thing I have to say... The next thing I got to say is this is the most intimidating interview that I have had to prep for since I started this series. <laughs> so, nah, not really. Trust me. I'm easy going, man. Like, let me tell you one very important thing. A lot of people have a lot to say about me. Like, there was one certain, I don't want to mention his name, Nigerian artist. So, when we met, it was just like, Ah, I heard that. You're so intense. I was like, who told you that? Must be from someone who don't know me. Because even when I was in Nigeria doing my music thing, I didn't used to hang out with too many people. So it was just, they're only judging me from the type of music I make. But I'm really a relaxed, laid back, chill person. Well, that makes me feel so, a lot better about this. So I, I read all your previous interviews. Yeah. And, and in the previous interviews, you said mm -hmm. two things. Uh, or you were quoted for saying two things. One was that you do tend to come off as standoffish sometimes. And then the other thing was that uh, you hate lazy questions from interviewers. So it made me feel like I had to get on my tip top nah, prior, no, prior to coming no. into this. <laughs> yeah, there was one. Yeah, you know what? Do you know? I, I know the reason why I said that because in Nigeria, right, when we used to go to do interviews, when we go to the red carpet, Trust me, I could actually lip sync and get everything they're going to ask me. Like, I knew everything. Uh, they, they'll say, um, so, Mode 9, what are you wearing? And I'll be like, <laughs> those. <laughs> uh, who made your coat? Which designer? What was that? I said, jeans, Levi's, trainers, Nike. Uh, uh, uh. Understood. <laughs> Understood. You know, we... How do you see the industry in the next five years? I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not a soothsayer, you know, sometimes, but if you answer like that, a lot of people just say, oh, he's arrogant. Yeah. So sometimes I just say, yeah, I see it getting better. Generic answers that I see it getting better. Yeah. But there's a new revolution that's about to happen. I predicted this new wave of Afrobeats. I predicted it, but there's nobody that's going to say, yes, he did. Because I remember when they were interviewing me, I said, the problem with our music right now, that it's too fast, that people are going to start liking it if they slow it down and people think that if you cannot, if the beat is slow, you can't dance to it. You can't dance to slow music. That was what they thought back then. But guess what? The music is slow now. And it's Sorry. even bigger. What's that Burner Boy song? Uh, this thing. Uh, oh, I forgot to do it. <laughs> I forgot to the, 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 mo the most popular one. It's slow. It's actually a sample of Brandy's beat. You go bow for the resort, though. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I do. I do not have any TMZ style clothing questions lined up for you. I can assure you I that know. we I know. we hit, we here to chop up some hip hop stuff, right? Of course, of um, course, of course. So, uh, we we just had. If you guys missed it, we just did a ten song tribute uh, to Mode Nine on the channel. 
uh, which really, really allowed me and a lot of the international viewership who, who uh, may not have been up to speed with a, with a very vast catalog that my guy had. Uh, so make sure you go and check that out if this is your first time tapping in with us. Um, it, there, there's not too many people that I talk to about you where the words legend and pioneer don't come up in the conversation, right? And that's, it's, it's these type of interviews, it's these type of opportunities that we have to really pay homage and show love proper and look back through the lens and shit like that, man. Right. So right. I want to thank you for all that, Doug, everything that you've done to, to bring us up to this point. And uh, let's get into it, man. I, I got some dope shit I want to talk to you about. I know, and like, I know. Pick, pick your brain on, man. So yeah. let's start off. I uh, I spend a lot of time uh, while doing research. Before you before you and I ever connected, ever, ever touched base, uh, I would I would hop into your lives. And I would watch the way that you interact with a lot of the fans and a lot of the conversations and stuff like that that you've had prior to us ever talking. And there was a couple things that stood out to me that I wanted to touch on and really like bring to the light, right? One of the things that I think is dope is you pay attention to the people who support you. Uh, so much so that like you were name dropping people based on their band camp purchases. Like you knew who who has the albums. You know who's really tapped in and what's who's a real supporter versus who's there for celebrity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Versus who, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Let, talk mm. talk about that like like that like like elaborate on that because that's dope. My Bandcamp family, even though I've been slacking a little bit, my Bandcamp family are like they're the most important thing to me because I just realized that back in Nigeria when we tried to put out music, we have to because we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't put it on iTunes and stuff. No artist could do that, so we used to use companies, and they take forty percent, right? They take forty percent and give you sixty. And then coming to the UK, I just realized, man, I registered with PRS and I just realized that I have a PayPal. We don't need these companies. I and mean, then, but I checked the amount that I get from iTunes and all these other guys. It's not very much. So I was talking to a friend of mine called Ray. He's a member of a collective called Straight Butter. And he told me they'd, they'd be making good money. I was like, how do you make him? It's a bank camp. So I did my little research, checked it, opened the bank camp. Even though I opened, I had one bank camp years ago, but I never really, I just had one song on it. I went, opened it again, changed the password, did everything, and uploaded all my albums on it. Even there's still some albums I haven't even released, still there. And then I just realized that it's more interactive. You can actually say, pay whatever you want, but not less than so so amount. You can even say this one is free, but pay whatever you want. It's really, and then anybody who buys, you get notified that this person bought. So I know the names. Um, some of these guys, there's a guy called Michael Esse. I'll never forget that dude. Michael Esse has spent more than $300, 300 pounds on my bank camp. And then there's another guy, Vicky Fed. These guys, man, I don't know, man. Every time I put something on this, Mostly old stuff that I'm putting out on my band camp. I'm going to put in the next um, two weeks, a new album should be out. But on band camp, it might be out before two weeks. But I have to put it on all platforms because the reason why I'm going to do that is because I know if I put it on only band camp, somebody could just buy it from band camp and upload it on the other platform. So I'm just going to cover all the platforms, but they don't really mean much to me. What I really look out, look at is my band camp, and I know that my band camp people, they're always going to support me. Always. That's why That's I just, I look at the people, I'm like, okay. And anytime I put something out, the people that register to my band camp, the message goes out to them first. They're going to be able to pre-order it. By next week, I'm sorting out some certain things, and then, because we're not doing promo, we're not on ground to do promo in Nigeria. We're going to have to be doing a lot of stuff on the internet. So we're going to find out little things. Maybe we we probably might. I, I'm not known for doing giveaways. I'm not known for doing giveaways. But where I'm seeing it, there might be a giveaway. Might be something to look out for. First of Nigerians all... Love People love free shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, to to talk to talk to an artist that has the type of prestige with with their with their fan base that you do, and the fact that you can name 
the fans that are that are going and contributing and stuff like that. Like though that that that's heavy and that speaks volumes. And like if I can do anything with this, if you guys are a fan of Mode Nine, I wanted to make this clear because I literally I heard this by chance in a live when I was just sitting back like trying to get a feel for them and stuff like that. So like I feel like there's a lot of people that may not know that that may not know that like your support is visible if you choose to go through these avenues and stuff like that. So like. That, that's super dope to bring attention to, you know what I'm saying? So, like, if you guys are looking for ways to support your favorite artists, Bandcamp seems to be the way to do it that's going to be direct, you know what I mean, and, and not get shafted. You said 40%? They were taking almost half almost half yeah. the money on the... I'm telling you, man, that was crazy. When I thought about it, I was like, geez. And guess what? I, I, I don't only just put stuff out on Bandcamp. I'm a fan, too. I'm a fan of this music. I bought... um. Well, what do people call themselves? Tanya Tanya Morgan, Tanya Morgan. I think they yeah. Tanya Morgan is is a group, a hip hop group. Very few people know about them. I bought their stuff on Bandcamp. I also bought uh, Apollo Brown, like Apollo Brown's like one of my number one producers. And anytime he puts out a project, I'm always on it. So, also a couple of other guys. There are a few other guys I listen to this stuff. If I like it, I will buy it. It's not very much, man. It's not very, it's not very much. You, you, like you can afford most of the stuff is affordable. Like I'm looking to even purchase merch and try and get my own merch going on. But that's a whole lot of work. If you have a full time job, you have to balance everything. It's mm -hmm. really hard because you know, like I got work. I have to be up five a.m. in the morning. So. Dude, I Try, trying to get this organized with you. I know, man. <laughs> My guy, yeah, I, I was like trying to set this up and I was like, cool, we can do Sunday. He's like, dog, I work Sundays too. I was like, all right. we got yeah. My man's hustling all the time. You know, you know, you have to thank the boss. You have to thank my boss because you know what? Uh, like where I work is called, is a tunneling. I work in a, a, a company, construction company that has tunneling. So we just remove the TBM tunnel boring machine. It, it stops where we are the shaft that we're in, right? It stops there. So we had to take it out bit by bit. And it took almost, uh, since August, we've been taking out the tunnel boring machine. And it just got out like last week. So they did a party at work and they were like, okay, we're giving you Saturday and Sunday off. That is the reason why I had today off. Let's go. Not, it, it worked out. out. Work. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, like and we, we had the party, man. Went to the party. It was, it was very relaxing, seeing all the the big boys, seeing all of them drunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a, I had an interview one time with a guy named Ali Joseph. He's an incredibly talented artist from the U.S., right? And yeah. one of the things that he talked about was like exactly what you're talking about now, like like working the full time job while also going and pushing after your career and pushing after your dreams. Because I think yeah. for a long time, there was a trope in hip hop that said like you had to be a high school dropout and you know what I mean? Live out of your car in order to go and pursue it. And it's just like, yo, that's, that's not the message to send the message. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, like very few people make it in hip hop. So like to tell someone that they have to go and, and reduce themselves to poverty before they can chase their dreams, it's it's not the message to send. So to hear you say like, dog, I'm working my ass off and still pursuing this, I think that's the message. Like I, I support that. Like like salute yeah. salute to that. Like that's that's the way to go about it, man. Like that that's dope. I used to tell these up and coming rappers because a lot of them be like, they they sit they send me messages, bros. Can you please give me some money? I need to help my career. Blah blah blah. And the one advice I always tell them. Listen, you need to get a job. Don't think that that job is going to come between you and your success. No. That job, with the money from your job, you'll be able to afford studio sessions. You'll be able to buy clothes. You'll be able to pay for plugs for your music. Man, come on. You could buy a nice. laptop. Right? Get a nice little nice. studio without any stress, without having to beg, you know? So people just think that, ah, oh, I'm an artist. I need to do this. I need to, I, I need not to work. Listen, if that's going to help you, just do it. And it will help you because it beats just going to meet people begging. It's, being a beggar is not really good, man. It's not good because it will limit you. You won't be able to move. But if you're making your own little money, if you're in a group like three of you and three of you are working, it makes it very easy. You just contribute money for anything. I knew a group back in the day. I think a couple of them are still around. Thoroughbreds. I used to shout them out on my music a lot. The Thoroughbreds. 
Il Bliss. I don't know if you know if you if you I, heard I, of I, I, Il Bliss. He was one of the thoroughbreds. Now all of them had jobs. Uh, one worked advertising. Uh, one was a graphic artist. Two of them worked in banks. Anytime they need to do a studio session, boom, they contribute money after work. Hit the studio, do their music. Uh, these guys, they really impressed me. They really inspired me. And at, at that time, I was working in a radio station. I, I newly quit my job. So I was in Lagos. I had no job. But I was trying to pursue the music hard. But I was I was looking at these guys. I was like, wow, I might as well just get me another job. But the only thing is that I had a, a little bubbling. I was bubbling to a certain level. So anytime I try to get a job, they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ain't you more than I see you on TV, man? <laughs> Ain't no way I'm gonna be bossing you around, man. Go do your music. You're too talented. <laughs> yeah, big suffering from your own success, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It, it was terrible, man. I think, dude, the, having that type of entrepreneurial mindset, this is a really good transition into the the next thing off the live. I caught another live uh, where you start talking about future plans and the idea of crowdfunding an album and making an album specifically for the fans and taking the input from the fans on the type of music that they want to hear for the people who chose to financially support and financially back you. Uh, do you mind elaborating on that? Is that still yeah. happening? Where are we at with that? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I talked to all of my guys. Like Ray is kind of like my business partner unofficial business partner because we talk about everything like he knows more about the online promo like he works it so he's more you know he's more on it than me like he comes and he, he gives me ideas he gave me gave me the idea for the band camp and then he was saying like listen why don't we do because i, I was reading something up our a uh, friend of mine natalie crew from la she sent me a link it was elzai elzai had an album he did a he did a little snippet of him saying that this is he doesn't want to compromise his music, so he needs the fans to tap in. It was a GoFundMe thing. I like GoFundMe, but I didn't want to use GoFundMe. I want to use Bandcamp. So my people on Bandcamp, just like what Elzai did, they are gonna fund the album, right? And there's no way that they will just give me money and then I'm just gonna spend the money and not say anything. No. When they uh, contribute money all of these names are going to be they're going to be um, what do they call it again they're going to be directors of the project executive okay. producers they're, they're going to get credited they're going to be credited on yes. the album yes definitely and on the last song I was planning to do was called Dedication I got that one from Smooth the Hustler and uh, he has Once Upon a Time in America. He had a song called Dedication. Even MOP, I think, have a song called Dedication. So I wanted to do something like that. That the last song on the project would be Dedication, where I dedicate the track to them, mention all the names of the people that contributed. So it's That's not right. as if they're just going to contribute and then, hey, we contributed in that. And then people say, you're lying. All you have to do is play them that record. And I'm like, oh, for real? Dedicated to them. Not that I can't, uh, like this album I, I'm about to put out, I funded it myself. I right. funded it myself. A friend of mine, um, one of the super fans that I have, Michael Essay, I remember him sending, he bought one of my albums on uh, Bandcamp. He bought it a hundred pounds. He said, okay. he said this one, yeah, I said, I, I, I'm, that's why I always shout out Michael Essay because this guy has bought everything and he said he's coming to London to see some of his family members in November that he would like to meet up with me. Listen, it doesn't matter when or where, whatever. I don't mind taking 30 minutes or, or one hour off break to go meet him wherever he is to just say hello to him because he has bought everything. I don't know That's him. Fine. I don't know what he looks like. I just know that he buys all. I just, one name keeps popping up. A guy that buys all my shit on Bandcamp. And there's another guy, Corridy. Corridy, but he buys too, but he's like, Corridy knows, he knows my music. Let me say he knows my catalog better than me. Sometimes he just be quoting me from, I be like, man, where did you get, <laughs> this guy knows my catalog better than me. So a, a couple of them that like, there's so many of them are like, man, you guys have to be part of this new project that I'm working on. And guess what? 
if I shoot a video, I won't mind sending, getting them to send snippets, snippets of them bobbing their head. Just film it with your phones. Just bobbing your head to the to the joint. Send it to me, and we edit it in the video. That's fine. So I got a video with my fans. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah. like that, this is this is the type of stuff, man. Like you have like people really have the opportunity to go and be seen and interact with like their their fucking their lead like no, that's that's fire dog. Uh, yeah. i think also like the fact that you're cool with like taking the time out of your day to go for meetups and stuff like oh, that and create great. these personal relationships i feel like like the the one of the best things that i can do with the platform is to get this information out because i know like i've interacted personally with a ton of artists even right not just fans other artists in nigeria who will quote just like your shit all the time or anytime like punch like I'm big on the battle scene. Do you, do you, I don't know if you follow uh battle rap Nigeria. I know, rap the, Nigeria. Genius. I okay, know right. the genius. <laughs> uh, shout I out to the, the genius. I know shout out. I know these battle rappers too, man. There's uh, one, there's, there's one. one. Are you familiar uh, with Fifth? Do you know who Fifth is? Fifth, I think I know him. I think I know him. I know Pacino. Uh Jay Pacino. Fifth. Uh I know Queen Mother. I know shout out to Queen Holyfield. Mother. Let's go. He's tapped in, yeah. baby. He's tapped in. I watch this shit, man. I'm a fan. Look, listen. I'm a fan. I'm a Damsey. I like Damsey too, man. Like uh, Black Lake Pasta. All these guys, man. I know all these guys, man. I watch this. I watch it. <laughs> this is I awesome. watch it. Even my boy. What's his name again? Oh. Oh. I've forgotten his name. Oh. He's the son of... um. Uh, 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 one of Nigeria's best, uh, most prominent actresses, uh, Shan George. I've forgotten his name, but he too, his name That's just skipped. It's right there, but it just you know how it does. It skips him and uh, his partner. He has a partner. Both of them battled in one of the last battle uh, joints like that, man. And it was cool, man. He's dope. He's super dope. I'll That's remember fire, before man. this interview finishes. I'm gonna remember his name. I, th I would say like so like that that's fucking that, just hearing this shit is so fucking dope and i, I know they're gonna geek out when i see this because i can vividly remember when i first got to the scene right and i first started checking out the the rappers i had i remember fifth would like quote me whenever i talked about like somebody had the best punchlines and he would always be like no shut up mode nine has the best punchlines in nigeria you know what i mean like motherfuckers were checking me left and right every time i would go and like try to big somebody up and stuff like that so to hear that you're also a fan of them like dog that's fire that's so dope man I was just talking. I was just talking to Slim Buck uh, about you. I think literally, let like probably less than two weeks ago. Uh, me and me and Buck were talking about that, and I was like, "Yo, this this this, this sorry, might happen." Sorry to break you up. I remember the guy's name, President Jaga. How the hell did I forget that name, man? <laughs> President <laughs> Jaga, man. Yeah, you need to check him out. It makes good music too, and he produces and he engineers. That's, he yeah, did. absolutely, Doug. I'm I'm tapped in with yeah. all these guys. This this is tap I, in, I tap in. I regret that I don't have more time. It takes a lot of time to react to a whole battle. You know what I'm saying? Because the battle yeah. itself is yeah. an hour plus commentary. It's a lot. But I try to I try to tap it as much as I can. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And then it's funny. You just mentioned uh, the genius, right? There's a lot yeah. of dope shit happening right now in Nigeria in the hip hop scene. Uh, specifically, the the genius is is partnered up with like Battle Rap Africa, and they had the place with uh, the hip hop event. And you have a yes. lot of these cats that are like, they have a venue now. They have this opportunity like to go and have a place to perform and host battles. They yes. just did uh Damadizi versus Loki uh, was one there. Yeah. They, just, they, they just had that and shit like that. Like there's spaces now where there wasn't before. And a lot of stuff yeah, is open up. Chalk City, the Chalk City venue, right? Right. Task. So it's it's uh, the MI's, MI's company Task yeah. uh, is partnered yeah. with them. And then you, and not only that, but you have you have MI and AQ uh, with like uh, the 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 uh, the head connect uh, and the new one, the Jive that MI just put out. They have like these companies okay. that are in existence now to help give the resources to artists That's as good, they man. come up. Ooh, there's That's a lot good. of dope shit. There's a lot of yeah. Dope because shit. prior to that, there was like nobody really supporting all these young bucks that really had bars. Like a lot of them used to hit me up, and you know I can't help everybody. There's a girl that um she hit me up and then I think I, I I heard her rap. She tagged me. She rapped over one of my beats, and I I never put that instrumental out. Elbow room. I never put the instrumental out. So I now asked her, how did you get the instrumental? Do you know what she said? She said uh -huh. she replayed it. She recreated. I was like, yeah. 
And she got bars. Her name is Thello Music. T H E. I know Thello. Yo, shout out to Thello. I know Thello. Look, yeah. I got a. I have an interview lined up with her. So her and I have a thing in the in the DMs, right? I told her like, yo, I can either get you on right now. We could do an interview, or I can wait until you have a project release, and then we could do the interview to promote the project. Um, so you shout out to Thello. She's very talented. Super, yeah, super she, talented. She's though. really good. She's really good. And you know what? I'm supposed to do a verse for her, but you know how busy it gets for me. Like, I mean, this is my own rule of thumb. If I don't feel like recording, I never record. I have to feel like it. If I don't feel like it, I won't do it. So for the past few weeks, like right now, I was just off. I was on the phone for like an hour plus with a producer called uh, um, Lou, uh, Stout Lewis. Stout Lewis, another Nigerian producer. He's a producer slash rapper. He's really dope. He's an OG, but he's mostly on the ground. I heard he sent me a beat in 2018, and I just listened to it this year, and I felt guilty. So I hit him up, and I was like, send me more beats. So he sent me more, and I, me and him were going back and forth, back and forth. That's how I do. But I produce mostly like my all my new projects. that I, I wanted to produce everything. But with him, I just said, you know what? Let me just do this project with him because I already promised him. And then fellow music. I'm going to do her track. She wants us to do a track. She sent me the beat. I will do it. I promise. And also my boy Ferocious from back in the day, I need to do the joint with Ferocious. So yeah, you need to oh, check out Ferocious. You gotta, I am not familiar with him. I'll, 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 I'll definitely tap in with you him. You need to. You got, the, you, got dope, the, man. you got the clock on you now. They're going to see the interview. You're going to get them all hyped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I never, ever, it might take a while, but I will do it. You know, when I say I'm going to do it, I have a video I want to put out. I, I was going to put out the video uh, th uh, this weekend. Uh, but since I couldn't go to Watford, I was supposed to go to, I, I would have been just coming back from Watford because I planned to go to Watford, but there was some train issues, so I didn't even go. I would have just been coming back. I would have put the video up. But since I didn't go to Watford to meet Ray, to discuss how we're going to do the, you know, and to get the other video. I have like three videos. I have a video called Breathe, a video called uh, Keep My Name Out Your Mouth, and a, a video called uh, A Hero Returns Part 2. Those three videos work. are coming out. Then I have something I did with a Swedish DJ slash producer. He released a sample pack. So I sampled from his sample pack, made a beat, sent the beat back to him. He did the scratch hooks, and it shit is marvelous. So... Uh, he, he's a YouTuber, so I want him to film his part, send it to me, then I'll go over to Ray's part, or we try to match his studio, book a space in Pirate Studios, shoot our part of the video, and edit it. That's what Let's we got. I'm just going to be shooting videos upon videos upon videos. You know? And you know what? This this came up so on Twitter when I whenever I when I told people that we maybe have a I may have a chance to sit down and have the interview with you. One of the things that that came up. Um, in conversation during my research, was the just a, the very large quantity of music videos that you tend to put out, even if they're just like you rapping, you know what I'm saying? Even if it's not a huge production, just the fact yeah. that there's visuals attached to it. Yeah. Is that like, where does that stem from? Is that just like something that you enjoy doing? Is there a reason that you like have that as a staple? What's, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, the thing is when I was signed to Question Mark, that was like a major label. We did some really high end, you know, high budget videos and everything. Uh, I was trying to tell the CEO, I told the CEO, I was like, yo, dude, man, why don't we just shoot some low budget videos, man? Just get a normal camera. You could get one of the boys to hold it. We just get we had a guy that was editing little stuff in this in the in the in the in the office. I was like, why don't we get Estimo to edit it? And he was like, No, 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 we we can't do that. I said, Man, there's just small videos. He didn't understand until I went to Germany, I did a Pentium IX was just me taking my, like I was signed to the label, but I recorded Pentium, Pentium IX by myself, went to Germany, shot videos in Germany by myself, just a little camcorder thing, edited it. I paid the guy 10,000 naira to edit it, edited it and they put it out and even MTV played it. I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. So the little videos, like I'm an underground, I'm like, First and foremost, I'm, I'm from that underground world, the MF Doom, the MF Grimm, all the, and I used to follow Battle Rack from Scribble Jam and everything. I'm like into that whole scene. 
Let's so I like go. these small videos. These small videos, they really mean a lot to me. I love shooting them. I love traveling. So now we went to Sweden. We shot a video in Sweden. I went to Germany, Hanover, Germany. I shot two videos in Germany. Now, the next pl place we're going to go is either Paris, Malta, Finland. Finland is a place I've never been to, so I reached out to my connect, and he has already sent me names of people who could just show me around when I go to Finland. And the guy that even sent me the name, like DJ, I've forgotten his name, DJ something, he sent me another name, and that guy was like, so what do you want me to do for you? I just said, no. I just want you to just show me around. That's it, you know? Not much, because I'm bringing the person that's going to shoot my video, so just show me around, mm -hmm. and then probably get some people that will be cool enough to just be in the video, have some new faces in the mid, make some connect. That like, hip hop is about networking. That's what people don't know. People, a lot of people just want to be, nah, nah, I'm better than you. No, no, no. Like I go to South Africa, my hands up. Why, man? I embrace everybody. Everybody who's That's willing beautiful. to approach from South Africa. That's one of the greatest MCs from Africa, man. That's a friend of mine. That's Mutual respect. I respect dude, man. Who, he is one who, of the best. What did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Proverb. What did you say? Proverb. proverb. Shout, out, shout out to Proverb. Shout out to Proverb. That's, to me, one of the best. First time I heard him, he was uh, featuring on a song that there's another guy called Amu. Like, for me, being a hip-hop head, I kind of know a little bit about hip-hop in nearly every single country in Africa. No, Not only yeah. in Africa, in the world sometimes. <laughs> I know some underground... So like I'm Dude, and and your your name goes out there. The, the first time that I ever got told about you, uh Stogie T is my guy, right? That's that's like oh, that's that's my Toomey. that's my guy. To me. Is that and, uh, ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like we had a podcast together, uh it was me, him and the pristine queen. And when we when I yeah. when we decided to to do the podcast, uh it was his decision to make it a pan-African podcast, not just a South African podcast. So he's the one that pushed me and he was like, yo you have to go and, and learn about the Nigerian hip hop scene. You have to go and learn about the, the Ghana and hip hop uh, scene and stuff like that. And that's where like the, the I started learning about, um, I first got into the, to the Nigerian hip hop scene with the MI Vector beef. And then, then that's where he, he starts educating me on, you know what I'm saying? He, he told me about mode nine and, and like what you stood for. And I'll tell you that I, I, I'm all, actually, I'm pretty sure I said this in, in the tribute. Um, but like when, when you were described to me, you were described to me by, by Stogan. He's like, yo, when when hip hop wasn't popping, Mode Nine was rapping, rapping. And when when there wasn't the when there wasn't the avenue, when there wasn't like the the market for it, Mode yeah. Nine was rapping, rapping. And like, yo, that's like that's what your fucking reputation has been. Just like sticking true to the roots and doing the shit that you want to do. But that didn't come from a Nigerian, honestly. That came from South Africa. So like, dog, right. like, it's it's I've mutual. Met me, I've met to me. I met to me uh, when we did the MC Africa. Uh, I met his DJ, DJ Papercut. Shout out to DJ Papercut. Uh, we we even have a project together. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. To me, to me is like is like one of the international MCs we have in in Africa because uh, I was doing stuff with an Australian Australian Afrobeat band, like, and they told me that the only African rapper they have on their uh, their project apart from me. And Terry the Rap Man, because I brought Terry the Rap Man in, was, was to me. To you know, me. like they have a, a relationship between South Africa and Australia that he can easily travel there. But at that time, we couldn't just go to Australia easily. The guys that the guys that came over, over from Australia is a whole is a whole band, Afrobeat. Not Afrobeats with the S. This is kind of Fela Kuti kind of Afrobeat. And we, me and Terry, were the first Nigerians that ever heard their music. And they were nervous in the hotel room. They were like, you're the first Nigerians we're ever going to play our music. <laughs> they were like this. And then we heard it, like, it was proper. <laughs> you know, the Afrobeat vibe. And I was like, this is marvelous. So me and Terry, we got on their, on their project. I need to reconnect with the guys, man. Lost Con, that was in 2008. But it's, it's all good. I try my best to know about hip hop heads all over like Zobs from Zimbabwe, uh Herbie right. Dangerous from Zimbabwe, Rest in Peace Mischief from uh, Zimbabwe based in South Africa, you know. 
There was a guy in South Africa too, Malik. There was a pro kid, rest in peace to pro kid. Like, I'm a fan of all these guys, man. I was always watching their videos when Channel O was big in Nigeria. I was always watching Squatter Camp. They were the first people that I saw. Like, uh, I really loved the shit. Even uh, they, they they had a problem with um, what they call what did they call the this thing um, uh, they they kind of they beat they they had this kind of uh, vibe that's kind of like almost uh, African techno or something like that. Funny enough, Quito. Quito. I right. loved it. I loved yeah, it. Yeah. Even when Mischief, they said Mischief fell off by doing Quito. I listened to the song that he did. Guess what? The song was nice. Music is music. It just depends on, sometimes you get bored doing what you're doing. Like me, I can enter my reggae phase. But for a lot of people do not even know that Mode 9, the hip hop head, started as a dance hall artist, I was a dance hall. I artist. didn't know that. I I did a lot of research. Very I didn't know that. Know. <laughs> Very few people know. Uh, are like, there I'll other records one. out there? Of course, of course. For my first record label, uh, my first single was like a dance hall. I murder them. A boy, I go die. Try this a guy, I get a boom, bye bye. X amount on the, the boy, you buy that. But it's stiff. But you mess with your eyes, that a mercy. We <laughs> bump tamp on the corner. Watch your boy try rock for dog damn bandana. But in dirt, I teach up like piranha. Cause they love me like they want to knock around them tree. When they see me, they get a fit. We will squeeze your face, cause they don't like me one bit. But if you ski the creep, you end up in a snake pit. I don't care whether you bigger, eh, you better. You qualify to whoop your body just like your father. You rather die than can't be the mode nine because I walk like a champion. Make your mother cry, but I'm a good if you hold me. When I'm coming like, nothing, unless a rude boy wants to be like, I want to get dead tonight. Right? Yo, let's get out! <laughs> that was Yo. like 1999. <laughs> Doug, let's go. My man brought, brought receipts. He said, he said, let's get into it, dog. I used, to do, I, I used to do that, man. And guess what? I had a lot of other songs. When I first started with my crew, SWAT Root, our first studio sessions, all my 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 raps were mixed. Like, like I started off being dance hall, then I started adding a little bit of rap into it. Like, that's why a lot of people liken my vibe to KRS-One, because he did that. There was a rapper from London called Dark Man. He did that, too, just... Probably one line rap, and then another line dance hall. They mix it up. I was mixing it up, you know. Dog, there's so nothing. There's stuff. nothing more hip hop than this fucking energy that you are giving off right now. Like seeing your face laid up, and like 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 hearing you low go and give credit and shout out people from all over. Like dog, this is beautiful. I this this yeah. is this is this is home for me. I, this is the type of shit. This is the type of conversation that I, I want to have. Like this is dog. Yeah. Thank you for this. This, this is, is fire. Not, it's not only about me. If if I'm gonna talk about me, I have to talk about the people that made me me. Because I wasn't always this, Dog. you know. There's a guy called LD Extra Large. Now there are two LDs. There's LD from Tribesmen, Shake okay. Body, <laughs> Shake Body. There's that LD Larry Dabry, and there's LD from our crew. Swat Root. Sporadic words and tactics rhyming on our terms. Swat route. That was my crew, the crew that I came up with. Now, LD was like, he was way more advanced than me, lyrically. In fact, the first time I heard LD freestyle, I was like, damn, I just kept my mouth shut. And then I heard their songs in Solo D's house. I heard their tracks that they had recorded, LD and Baron. I was like, damn, I had to go home and destroy all my rhymes. And start writing fresh rhymes. Start all over. <laughs> because it was my crew. Then we will record songs and then we'll go back to Solo D's crib and we'll be listening. So anybody that drops a dope line, they'll be like, woo, woo, woo. And they were all doing woo, woo to other people's rhymes. And then we came to mind, I was just rapping straight, like, uh, something, something, uh, I can't even remember that rhyme. I know the rhyme is somewhere in my head, but that was way, that is long ago. So I just rap in straight, man. No punchlines, nothing. And then they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good flow, nice flow. So in my mind, I was like, hmm, nice line for everybody else. That's nice punchline. Nice line. flow for you. And nice flow for me. Okay. So I got to say something crazy, right? And then I was dubbing tapes from LD, who dubbed Master Ace, dubbed all these uh, Helter Skelter, Smith from Western. 
I'll go, uh, listen, I remember having the Fuji's, then I had no instrumental. So what I used to do when I'm writing rhymes, I'll be playing the Fuji's whole album. And then we, they'll be rapping on it. Right, and I'll right. be writing rhymes to it. I'm rapping along, like rapping something different, trying to blur out what they're rapping and just use their beat to write. So <laughs> I was on that tip. I was writing like for a whole, a whole uh, holiday for the semester. I just stayed at home writing bars. Stayed at home writing bars. The best in your hood doesn't mean that you're the best. You're just the best in your hood because your hood is whack. <laughs> and I was like, for a long time in my hood, I was like the man. But when I went to rap amongst these guys, these guys were way ahead of me in both performance and rapping. Lyrically. Let's go. Lyrically, they were way ahead of me. I was just like, so I, and one thing about me, I have this uh, nature. If I start something, I go crazy with it. So the punchline thing, I just started saying, okay, let's start saying clever things. So I started reading more. I started reading more, mentioning different things, history, you know. And then when we started, you know, doing our other tracks and they were playing it and then I was like, oh, nice line. And in my mind, I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So the validation from that, my crew, meant a lot to me because these are what we call high-value rappers. Mm. They are guys that know, like, these are LD Extra Large, Mr. Baron, Six foot plus, you need to talk to six foot plus too. Highly intelligent individual. Mr. Baron, LD, six foot plus, Solo D, that's the leader of the crew. Solo D, I call him the godfather of Nigerian real hip hop. Okay. He's the godfather. Yeah, even though people don't want to say it, but a whole lot of people know. A whole lot of people. None of the people that you've talked to, none of them will say, oh, no, I've never heard of Solo D. They know Solo D. So you put me on right now. You put me on right now. He he put the whole crew together, and you know what? I really like. If not for Solo D, I wouldn't be doing this music. I wouldn't. Bro, if seeing you pay him, homage I... like that, this this is dope as shit. Now you know what's know what's like a really cool takeaway from this too is like I feel like I have so I'm doing a whole uh docu series with up and coming artists in Nigeria. I have five artists that I think were super fucking dope. And I'm I'm questioning them about like their views on the industry, their views on the people, you know what I'm saying, who are considered commercial and stuff like that. And I think that like one of the things that I've noticed is everybody, the the every it's hard to take uh for granted, like a lot of people take for granted all the tools that are available right now. Like you're talking about, yo, I didn't have instrumentals. I was writing along while motherfuckers was rapping and I had to block them out while I was writing my own shit and stuff like that. Like, like these are the stories that get out. Like that's the stuff to, to promote and the push and stuff. You know what I mean? Like no excuses. Like if you really want to do it, you're going to go and you're going to find a way to do it and shit like that. Like that's a, that's a fire story, Doug. Yeah. Do you know what? I tell most of these new cats, I was like, you have everything at your disposal. You can get a laptop, you can get a laptop, secondhand laptop. You can produce on that laptop. You can record your voice even on your, you can actually produce and record on the iPhone. There are ways to do it. If you check uh, YouTube, how to record a track on your iPhone, it's there. You can do everything. Back then, do you know what? If you didn't have a that tape, if you didn't have money to book a, a session, we used to book a, a, a studio called Evanesra and then one other AVI, AVI, and then Evanesra. It was expensive. Unless you were making some type of money, you wouldn't be able to book a session. And after booking a session, you're booking one session, you have to pay for the engineer and you have to pay right. for a producer. So back then, not many people were booking sessions there were many artists now everybody's an artist because they can make a music they can make music on their laptop fruity loops and they can voice it at home back then nobody was voicing at home not one person was voicing at home back then you had to pay and unless you had a little cash you're not gonna you well, and then no some way. record labels had studios so record labels were taking care of their artists unless you were signed unless you had some money so it was different. 
Now you could do just do anything, but they still be in inside artist DMs just because they take advantage of some artists who reply like me. Yeah, I'll reply, I'll give you free advice. I'm not gonna charge you for advice. I'll give you free advice. But they try to always say, jump on my track, jump on my track. Why? Back in the days, I used to help people. I've helped a lot of people. I used to, I used to just, uh, you know, feel bad for some artists that never get put on. And so when they say jump on my track, I used to jump on their tracks. But guess what used to happen? They do the track and they never put it out. Just because they got your verse for free, they would never put it out. Mm -hmm. I, I've ha I have several. I went to my hard drive and I was just counting all the features that I had that didn't see the light of day. I did it in on live. I was like showing people on live, look at this folder, look at all these tracks, none of them made it yeah. out. That is why I don't do features anymore. You you talked about I'm this sorry. too, like when I was checking it out, you like um, a lot of times like you had like the international collabs. I think it was a guy in Germany where you had a similar situation, you know what I mean? Where someone did like half the work and then cut out afterwards, then it sat there Figo. for six years. Figur Brazovic. And he's a big big time producer in uh, in Berlin now. Figure I did. I, do you know what? I actually flew myself to Berlin because the guy that connected me to Figure is a, a guy called DJ Grizzly. I've been doing stuff with Grizzly on and off since 2006, and he's my boy. So Figure he told me about Figure. He sent me beats like 200 beats to choose, like 14 or so. So I was excited. I chose the 14, and guess what? In two weeks, I had the whole project recorded. Because I was excited. Right. Only for this guy to delay, delay, delay. It's getting to two years. And then he, and I told him, what happens if I come to Germany? He said, yeah, maybe if you come, then you'll finish it. Cool. So I bought myself a ticket, flew all the way to Berlin. To even meet him when I got there, I had a three weeks in Berlin. I only met him <laughs> the last week. Wow. And then when we did one session, he only kind of mixed two tracks. He was like, oh, this was in February 2014. Oh, you know what? When you get to Nigeria in February ending, I will send you the whole thing. And he didn't send me nothing. So I took that a cappella. I divided the project into two. I gave some to a producer called Stomatic. And we did one called The Monument. I think it was like seven or so tracks. We put that out. And then after I gave the rest to... Texilla and Texilla, we finished that and it was esoteric mellow. Yo, there's I, there's very few interviews that I've done with Nigerian artists that doesn't result in Texilla getting a shout out. Like <laughs> I've yeah, never heard no one say nothing bad about that man. Shout out to Texilla, man. Tech's calm, man. Tech is calm. That's all I can say about Tech. He's calm. <laughs> I've never seen Tech like under pressure. He's a calm guy. Yeah. Maybe that comes from the martial arts that he's into. You know, but he's a calm guy. See, I'm glad. See, he's now I'm glad I, I'm talking positive about him. You tell me he's Martin in the martial arts now. I'm glad I never said nothing bad. <laughs> <laughs> he's our RZA. <laughs> Take, our RZA. You know, and Ray, he, him and Ray, him and Ray, they're actually the same crew, straight butter. So I'm really good with these guys. Te uh, Texilla, Ray, um, XYZ, uh, RQ, uh, Mr. Deck, you know. All of these guys, they're all straight butter guys, and I've been cool, cool with straight. I actually, first Texilla beat I ever rhymed on, I'd not even met him. It was in 2004. It was a Madman Symphony. That was the name of the track. It was, <laughs> it was some guys, they came, um, Buddha and uh, one other guy, Don P. The, the Buddha and Don P, they said, no, we used to hang, hang around in the same studio, come and jump on this track. So I heard the beat, the beat was weird, like, Kind of like MF Doomish. I was like, damn, this is mad. Quickly wrote, and I voiced it. So I remember that. I remember the name Texilla. Then I came across him much later. And I was like, oh, you're the Texilla. <laughs> work. Finally, we got some work done on uh, the Insulin album. And that was some crazy shit, man. Texilla is the man. I must say, we we did a whole project together. Um, um esoteric mellow in 2019 and the way it looks like me and Techzilla, we could jump on another project man uh, the kind of shit that i'm going to be rapping about in my other projects from now on that guys don't worry just just rap about your pretty stuff your your nice little cars <laughs> your nice little girlfriends with big uh, bbls just 
talk about that stuff, the happy stuff, the Bojangle, Bo Diddy Bop <laughs> shit. Please just do that. Don't come and try to do what I'm doing. Leave it for rappers like me, probably Boogie, and a couple of other guys that their minds are, you know, focused on that kind of deep philosophy. Like, let me show you. This is called the, the philosophy book. Big ideas simply explained. Yes. I get a lot of ideas from philosophy. But don't get it twisted. I can write about philosophy without opening this book. But when I read this book, it just gives me some other kind of ideas. It's not that I'm just copy and pasting, but it's right. applied. Like to be dope with punchlines, it's kind of like it's like applied. You have to apply a different, you, know, you read something, it's like applied mathematics. It's mathematics, but it's different. You have to use it, apply it to everyday life. You know, so that's what I do with bars. Like I, I was trying to go on YouTube and teach people how to draw punchlines, which is quite easy. Once you're learned to a certain extent, you don't have to be a college graduate. Once you can read and write properly, there are levels. Punchline is not is not that difficult. You just have to be clever with, it. pay attention to detail. You can actually drop punchlines. Like there's one Nigerian rapper. He said, "Uh, they carry shoulder up. Like say, you get boiled for armpits. When a Nigerian says you're carrying your shoulder up, it means you're behaving proud. But he said you're carrying your shoulders up like you have balls on your armpit. Now, if you have balls on your armpit, your, your hands are gonna be like this." <laughs> If you have rashes on your arm, I got, I got you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So that Nigerian rapper, I think his name was Buster. Uh, it was a, a guy called Mr. Raw. Mr. Raw told me about that line, and that line that just made me laugh. You know, uh, even one of my pigeon English raps, I said, "Them be bungalow brains, nothing upstairs. Bungalow brains, nothing upstairs. A bungalow has no." I got you. I, you, I'm a I'm a battle rapper, my guy. I, I'm I'm right there with you. I've been battle rapper for yeah, the last well, 16 years. You get it. You get yeah, it. Yeah. A lot of the you audience. I got you. Well, you know, but the people a lot. You know one funny thing. A lot of people don't get it. One guy. There's a line that I dropped in a song that I did. It's about to get ugly. P U S S Y like up a chick's thighs. You know, alcoholics won't trip for you uh, on a tightrope. Something like that. The guy didn't get that for almost 12 years. So he hits me on a private or the DM in a Twitter. And he said, bro, I feel so bad. I was like, I type back. Why? I just got your line from it's about to get ugly. Guess how old it's about to get ugly. It's like a decade old. <laughs> decade? It's about to get ugly it was like the first solo video I ever did in my life. That was in 2001. I recorded that song when the towers, the twin towers came down. I remember coming back from the studio, not knowing what happened, went to sleep, woke up, and then everybody was like, hey, yeah, what happened in America? And I was like, what, 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 what? Twin hmm. towers. I was like, damn. That's how I know when I recorded what the it's about was. to get ugly. And then the video came shortly after that. So that was my first video. And that song, I put that song shortly after. The song blew up in Lagos. Like, surprising to me, because Lagos people never really liked real hip-hop at that time. Mm -hmm. It blew up. And that guy had been listening to that song for more than 10 years, 12 years. And he never got that line. He just got the line. And then I, when I broke down the rest of the track for him, he was just like, bro, bro, I won't lie to you. My brother said, you're going to run out of bars in 2004. My brother said, these kind of in, intense bars will only last for three years. But in 2020-something, you're still <laughs> dropping it. I think right. there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to say in the, in the art of writing, right? And, and punchlines themselves have developed throughout the years. They go through trends, right? The way that we yes. set up and set up the fucking bars and shit like that. Yeah. I think a lot of that definitely is going to get credit. You you came up, you know, talking about battle rap and stuff like that. Like, yeah, though they're the they're the best writers in the fucking world are fucking battle rappers, though. Like, like the the level of writing and the level of of fucking pushing your pen. That's the whole point. That's the, that's the that's the entire point of it. You know what I'm saying? So one like, of, one of, 
the most incredible battle rappers that I've heard. A lot of people would disagree with me, but the most incredible battle rapper I've heard, his name is Disaster. Okay. He's battling Crooked Eye coming up too. He's got a huge one coming up with him and Crook. That's going to be amazing. Crook, better be careful, man. I know Crook it's, is a dope rapper. It's, I don't know yo, how to call it. I don't know how to call it, dog. I don't know how to call it. Like, words, man. We we have we have a very bad precedent set with Hollow and Budden, right? So there's a bad precedent that's already been set prior to coming into this. Now you have Disaster and Crook coming at it, and it's like, yo, the the pressure is there, the eyes are there, like, like don't don't be the next cannabis situation. You know what I'm saying? Like don't don't let that fucking happen to you, Crook. Like, is is gonna be something, man? Listen, Disaster on a good day, nobody can beat Disaster. On a good day when he's super focused, there's nobody that can beat him. I've seen him lose a couple of times. He lost to T-Rex. They even say he lost to that girl. What's her name again? Big, big uh, O, what's her name? Official? He lost to, uh, official, yeah. He said they, they say he lost to uh, Arcade. He had everything in his favor, but he still lost to Arcade. That was rigged. He lost to DNA slightly. That's what they say. But None of those people he lost to, they say he lost to uh, Fabul uh, Cassidy. None of them can touch him. That's that's what I feel. I feel yes. Yeah, sometimes you might just be slightly off your game and everything, but on a real, none of them can touch him. And that's me. You see, like I listen to disaster. Right. I understand what he says, and what he says is phenomenal. It's fantastic. Like, there was a guy that was close to him, Jonai. Everybody said Jonai was going to beat Disaster. He took that Disaster battle too soon, and Disaster finished, ended his career. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, what, is, what is it that you relate to him? Because, like, Disaster is a very unique case, especially stylistically. He's one of the only ones who tried to actively incorporate the, the live freestyle um, flows and deliveries and, and like attributes and stuff into it. Is that what it is that does it for you? Is it that kind of sometimes you don't know when he's freestyling or when he's rapping? So I fucking take a take a take a rabbit scimitar, slash your fingers up and put it on smoking like a cigar. Blah, blah, blah. He just I'm like, wait a minute, did he just freestyle that? I was like, Fuck. there's some other guys that are phenomenal, but you know what? I like him because yeah, he can do a gun bar every now and then, but he makes it special. But the guys that go, I got the chopper, I got a chucker spray, blah, 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 blah. It gets, after a while, it gets boring. It gets boring. I like Hollow the Dawn because Hollow the Dawn is clever, is interesting, but styles make matches like work. If he's battling somebody that's really boring and shit that he doesn't really have fire for, it's going to be a boring matchup. But if he's battling somebody that really gives him that, uh, then it's dope. It's like Math Hoffa. Math Hoffa is is a dope battle rapper, but Math was kind of lazy. <laughs> but Math was dope. He was doing so many battles, and he was not choking as much as the other guys. Another guy that uh, I liked Goods because Goods just came with the swag and the bravado. The I don't care drinking his Hennessy. I don't care what you say, man. I'm just gonna flame you. Yeah, I'm sweating. I make that ball berry look good. You know. I like good because of that. <laughs> Averb, um, Averb, I like Averb because early on when Averb came, he didn't give a damn. He went to New York to battle. He was calling ca cats out. He was calling cats out in New York. And they were arguing themselves. And then Good said, I got some pussy set up. I don't want to fight. I was like, what? This guy came all the way from New Orleans to New York. Is it New Orleans? No, where's he from again? Not New Orleans. Oh, where's he from? Um, anyway, he came all the way from where he came from. And he got everybody shook. Then Hollow the Dawn came. I mean, no, uh, um, Hitman Holler. Hitman Holler came with the remixes. Like, I pay mm -hmm. attention to all this shit. That's why nobody can tell me nothing. Is there, is there any chance of them getting you back? Like, anybody. Is there any chance of you stepping back in any capacity? into like like battle rap is bigger than it ever has been uh they, i think they put the statistics out the last the, the last summer madness trended above football in america like Whoa. like it's 
it's it's doing shit, dog. Like like things are doing. Uh, even in Nigeria, not even just in America, even in Nigeria, like you have the hip hop event, you have word on the streets. You, you know what I'm saying? Which is the battle rap Nigeria rebranded and stuff like that. Like they have yeah. a lot of the stuff that's going down. Is there any chance of seeing Mode Nine in some capacity, whether it's a host or participant or, or something like that? Is there any chance of seeing you interacting with them? I would never battle. Because <laughs> making music. I could tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you, all these rappers that say, yeah, I can battle. Yes, I used to battle back in the day, but that was different. It was off the head and it was on beat. It was off the, I remember when Guru, rest his, I rest respect. His beat, Nigeria, you know, he had a show battle. I battled, man. It, it, me and one guy, they said it was a tie. The guy came from UK and he was flaming everybody. I was like, wait, hold on, hold on. Let, let me ask some of that. And then we battled back and forth, back and forth. And they were like, yo, Guru said, yo, it's a tie. Then when we were going, Guru whispered in my ear, I think you got that. <laughs> but he didn't want to piss anybody off. But I understand. So, yeah, that. Um, but me, battle rapping, I love it. I watched it and everything. But you know what? At the end of the day, I just wanted to make music. I mean, making music is where it's at for me. I'm not a battle rapper. But... I can relate to what battle rappers do. What they do is very difficult. It. It's actually harder than making music because every time you show up, you have to come with different bars. You have to remember your bars. You have to come with different bars. Like me, I can perform a song that I did 20 years ago. The lyrics never change. It's still the same lyrics. Right. So you You're know, not, you're not reinventing yourself every every six months. To, completely reinventing yourself. I'm not trying to break my head to remember all these bars. I'm not trying to break my listen, writing bars that I'm only going to say once. I'm stingy with my shit. It has to be done over and over again. Like I'm not going to say write bars that I was going to say to one person. I can't perform it anywhere I go. It's just bars for one specific person. No, I don't think I don't think I'll battle rap as much as I support it. Like the genius talked to me about it. How much would it take to give you yeah, about maybe maybe to make me change my mind? Maybe you can give me five hundred million. <laughs> 500 million like uh, half a trillion man half a trillion half a trillion? <laughs> I'll battle I'll battle for half a trillion man ain't nobody gonna say no to that <laughs> Just, there's a, so there's a, there's some cool shit that's happening right now too uh in the battle scene so check this out um i got recruited by you know what mac you were talking about scribble jam and other things uh yeah. Ill Mac immaculate is is uh so I'm I'm battling for him on a card that he put together um on November 3rd. And what Ooh. he's doing is he's hosting Twitter space battles on Twitter. So he for puts real? the cards together and he's he's allowing people from all over different countries, all, all like wherever the fuck you're from, whatever like that. The Twitter space is allowing people who don't have the funds necessarily to go and travel to do the live stuff and stuff like that mm. to really be able to like showcase their stuff and shit. Um, so there is there's a there's a new resurgence in battle and it, it's in battle rap and it's it's like it's reinventing itself constantly. So like the Twitter space stuff right now, I'm very interested to see where it goes because they're using oh, it as cool. like a as a proving grounds to then pluck mm. people from there to mm. do the live stuff. You know what I mean? And to do it in a way that doesn't like, uh, for instance, there are a lot of stories about battle rap when it was up and coming about artists that were forced to like, you know, pay for their own flights, go someplace, yeah. get their yeah. own booking for a hotel and everything like that, yeah. just to choke in the first round. And you know what I'm saying? Like put themselves in a fucking hole. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a lot of trial and error. And I think with technology, the same way you're saying, like how it's easier now for people to go in and make music right from their home off their laptop and stuff like that. Yeah. There's it's now easier in the battle scene too because they're they're able to go and filter out the talent and pick the people who are really really capable. You know what I'm saying, and not won't embarrass themselves and shit. That's great. That's great, man. I'm sure uh, the genius needs to tap in, man. He yeah. needs to tap in, man, because they got a lot of talented people over there, man. Doing a needy, hungry. Do you know what? If you're an old dog, been doing this music for a long time, and you said, like, oh, let me go battle for the money. Listen, I'm talking to all the OGs out there. One of these young cops is going <laughs> to eat your food. One of these young this cops is, is going to bite your head off. No, for real. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many bars you got. Do you know, do you know what battle rap is? Battle rap is not actually just rapping. You can have the best bars, but deliver it like this. I'll take your performance. Hand. Yeah. Somebody just comes, what? What motherfucking Canada? I'm back. You know, it's attitude. <laughs> and then a, a guy can just 
do a bullshit bar and just move to the side and just look you up or down like, hey, you sneakers whack. And the whole crowd just go up <laughs> and smoke. <laughs> he could just do some genetic shit. Uh, have you heard of a guy called O Solo? O Solo? No. He had one bar, like, this is some old battle rap shit. Like, he's from New Jersey. Some funny shit. I bring one nigga, bring two niggas, and two niggas, bring three niggas, and four niggas, bring five niggas. <laughs> hey, remember B Magic? Yeah. If I to battle, I will give that B Magic feel because B Magic had bars. I can see that. I can see but that. Imagine when B Magic battled Daylight. Daylight said before the battle, I'm going to do a magic trick. I'm going to make magic disappear. Daylight didn't come with the bars that magic had, but guess what? Nobody was talking about B Magic's bars after that battle. They all, he did the Matrix thing. It was in, in right. U Dub. It was in U Dub. That's Arsenal's Battle League. He did the Matrix thing. Everybody on stage did the Matrix with him. And guess what? The crowd now started doing it with him. That's it. Like, in battle rap, you have to have everything. Performance, you have to have delivery. And I'm not talking about delivering your bars. You have to know how to deliver with pause, when to remember your bars when the crowds go crazy. You have to know all that shit. That's a lot of work. I think these battle rappers are grossly underpaid. Let's like, talk about it. This is talk. This is Ah, this is home, baby. I love this. This is this is they see you giving this homage and 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 to see how in tune we are with everything, my guy. This is fire. This is super dope. This is and yeah, and mean, you know what? There's not a lot of people too, especially that have made it, commercial artists, big artists, stuff like that, that would be able to have the wherewithal to say, like, look, don't don't go <laughs> because you can make an album because you got fans because like don't go thinking that that, that these young bulls ain't gonna fucking cook you the fuck up, dog. Young cubs is gonna bite your head off it's straight up, and they're, they're hungry. hungry. They're hungry, they're exactly. Hungry, man. Youth can trump experience at sometimes. Youth can trump experience. Especially if you're not tapped in too. Like I talk a lot of like this is a lot of things. Like people who are involved in battle rap versus artists who are not involved in battle rap. You can tell when an artist who doesn't follow battle rap thinks that they came up with a uniquely clever bar, like they just made that punchline. And it's a punchline that we've heard 5,000 times over and over and over and over and over again. And yeah. like their fans think it's the greatest thing in the world because they're not yeah. tapped in with the entire world that is yeah. creating yeah. dope punchlines and shit like that. So like, there's there's a lot of misconception when it comes to I who can do what, I got a gun so big. I got a gun so big line. I got a gun so big. I can use Biggie as one of the bullets. <laughs> Nobody has used that. But a guy comes up with that, oh, another gun so big, man. Mm. And a, a mainstream artist says that, and we're like, woo! But the bar's different. The so bar's big. different. The bar's we, different. We the, they so they have... Too it, many times. So many. I no, got I got to do that anymore. All right. Let's, um, so let's, let's talk, like, it, with your time... In battle rap and, and and things of that nature, uh, I know you've bumped heads with artists in the past. Um, yeah. As of right now, current current day mode nine is is there any energy like that that's left? Are you cool with everyone now? Is there anyone like what's going on? It's all love, man. It's all Maria. It's all it's all love, Angel Di Maria. It's all love. You know, Angel Di Maria plays for Juventus. Anytime he scores a goal, he goes like this. <laughs> so that's why I said it's all love, Angel Di Maria. <laughs> so no, you know what? Like I always say this, like me, I never go looking for trouble. There were some artists back then in Nigeria. Everybody was saying they were whack, but they were getting a lot of airplay, a lot of spotlight and everything. So uh, most of the guys that felt they were doing real hip hop said, let's diss them, let's diss them. But the reason why I didn't diss the guy was because one, I didn't really know him like that. I didn't know him. In short, I didn't know him. And he says he's the best rapper, right? But he, everybody felt that he was whack because he had this jiggy jiggy jiggy. He wasn't really saying much. So they were like, diss him, diss him. I was like, but why would I diss him? He has never, he hasn't mentioned my name, but they said, but he's dissing you by saying he's the best rapper. And I said, listen, if you are a rapper and you don't think you're the best rapper, 
you shouldn't be rapping, man. Everybody has the right to feel he's the best. So I don't care what he says, you know. So some guys, they went around, they dissed him and everything, and they got pissed at me because I didn't appear in their video. But guess what? I later traveled with this guy, Idris Abdul Karim, that's his name. I later traveled with him, went on tour with him. And guess, he was a nice guy, man. He was cool. He even bought me, there's a cap I did, in, uh, I wore in uh, one of Jimmy Jack's videos, Styling with a nine on it he bought me that hat in italy when we when we were on tour i mean if i had this this guy i would have felt like a total asshole man i didn't know him and then when i got to know him i was like this guy is cool man it's just some hip-hop shit there's difference between real life and hip-hop shit that's what people don't understand you see these people in uh, in chicago people in america like you're doing things for clout and killing themselves like they got the edges blurred. It's now blurred. Now, a lot of people back in the 90s, you talk about, you know, yeah, I got the blama, blah, 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 blah. But the rappers will never go shoot somebody. But now we got rappers with shooters too, the shooters who want to rap. So it's all blurred now. So at the end of the day, man, I just do this music thing just because it's therapeutic. I could say I, I don't want to do music again and I, I wouldn't suffer. But I spent a lot of money. Oops. I spent a lot of money on, on this. On all my studios. Shit. My hard drives. I got I got three systems here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt that fair. I got I got this one. I got that one. And I got this one. <laughs> so it just shows that I really love this shit, man. Yeah, I really and I so that that's one of the things that I noticed. Um, when, again, when, when I was reading your previous interviews, you made a you made a shift that like into to, to like your interest into producing more, right? So you're you're getting interested into like actually going and purchasing. You know what I'm saying? Like the tools yes. that, that you need yes. to go. Yes. And obviously, you're showing that off now. Is, is, is are we gonna have um? You name drop before. You know some artists that you've done production for full production yeah. for and stuff like that prior. Are we going to see more of that side of Mode 9 in the future? Is, yeah, it, is it looking to, to expand on? I try to produce for people. I have a project with a rapper called Avid. He's really dope. Super dope. Avid. I met him uh, my early days going to PH City, Port Harcourt. And he was a really, really dope. He was signed to a guy that I knew, Latte. But I don't think he's signed with the guy anymore. But I just hit him up. What are you doing, man? And he was like, he wants to freestyle he wants to do a little rap over one of my beat tapes because i put out a beat tape called blackula uh october 31st 2019 so he wanted to rap to one of the beats and i was like why don't i just send you beats and you can do a project and he was like okay so i sent him beats and he recorded that sent the recording back to me i did a little mix and everything we put it out for free so I produce for people, man. I even who else did I produce for? I produced for Terry the Rap Man, called that one Goat Pepper Soup. That was on his album. Uh who else did I produce? I produced for a couple of people, but nobody major, major. They don't want my beats. My beats are too hip hop for them. <laughs> you know, and this this is a great transition because that, that statement right there, I want to talk about Invicta. All right. Uh so so we I tap in with Invicta, right? That's the that's the first thing you and I talked about. We were talking about like yo, like like what's new, what's coming out, what's popping, right? Yeah. And on Invicta, you directly address uh some of the Afro beats um pressure, right? Some of the Afro beats pressure yeah. that's out there and your personal opinions on it. Um I, I have a power I don't really rock with Afro beat without sounding like a little bit of a bitter hater. I, I it, wanted to I wanted I want to draw a parallel yeah. and and if you allow me to 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 walk with this real quick all right okay so there's Go a ahead. parallel right now between uh Nigeria and South Africa so Nigeria with what they're experiencing with afro beats blowing up yes. right now it's very similar to South Africa with on piano, I'm a piano. And, <laughs> and and how and how that's that's going up now there's an artist there called reason right and yeah, reason reason, reason made some Reasons made statements that hip hop wasn't showing him the love that he felt as though he deserved and that hip hop wasn't giving him the respect for the work that he has put in, so on and so forth. So he has branched out and started creating 
I'm a piano music and received a lot of backlash because of that. Now, if I may, no I know the, par brother. the parallel there is yeah. you are, from my research, on record of saying that hip hop in Nigeria hasn't shown you the love, specifically uh, the, the, the music industry side of it, right? Yeah. Has not showed you the love in the same respect, the same way the reason mm -hmm. said this. However, you're not going and running and saying like, cool, I'm running the Afro beats then. You've decided to double down and dig your heels in. Let's talk about it. What's like that? This, that's a big decision right there. Yo, uh, Fortune, Mas Fortune Masimba, right? Masinga, right? Fortune, a friend of mine, uh, Fortune, he, he used to rap back in the day. Yeah? He even had an album, right? Anytime I'm in South Africa, I holler at Fortune. He's a good dude. Uh, I think Reason is his brother. Now, they are hip hop heads. There's nothing you can't take that away from them. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they also vibe to Kwaito and other music and everything. It's just like like Fortune's whole family. They could play. They could listen to anything and just you know vibe off it, dance. You know, not everybody in his family is a hip hop head. I know Reason. Reason like back in the day was like heavy into hip hop, and I know it's hard. It gets really hard when you're doing something and then people are just like, especially the industry. The industry show me like light love. I could call it light love. For me to say they showed me no love would be a lie because there were some people in the industry that wow. really pushed to play my music on TV. You know, a lot of, there were, there were quite a few people that showed me love. Shout out to Kenny Ogunbe because when he saw my video, he was like, listen, there was just one instrument that I just heard on this track. It just blew my mind. That's why I'm playing it. And he didn't have to play. He didn't have to play my video. Then it was one of the hardest primetime jams. It was one of the hardest programs to get your video on. And he played it. So for me to turn my back and say, nobody showed me love, I'll be lying. There were people that showed me love. But a lot of people didn't do what they were supposed to do. A lot of people, there were some people that I knew quite well. I was like, dude, come on, man. All you have to do is play this. If I was in your shoes, I would play it. I was on radio in Nigeria back in the day. I played a lot of people's music. I took no money from anybody. Like I didn't ask for money from no one. I just played good music. If you're my guy and you had good music, send it to me. How did I start knowing a, a crew called Rooftop MCs? Six Foot Plus traveled to Lagos. He brought me back a CD. It had no picture, just the name, Rooftop MCs, and the name of the song. I played it, and I was like, what? It was shock therapy. It was gospel slash hip-hop slash rock. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? I thought the chorus was a sample. It wasn't. It was a guy called Kobam Sasupo. He produced it, and he did the chorus, and I was like, this is fantastic. I played it every single day. I showed love to people, but when it came to, when I quit the radio station, went back to Lagos to try and dig in and do this music, man, it was it was really hard. It was hard to get, there was a certain radio station that didn't want to play my music, didn't want to interview me because they knew that I worked for Rhythm FM. And just because, even though I wasn't working there no more, they just didn't want to interview, show me no love, it was tough. But, mm. with all that being said, I still was like, this is going to make me want to piss them off the more. I'm going to still do this. <laughs> I don't care. Now, but when I sign to a major label, now, when you sign to a major label, it's different. It's business. If they put money on your head, if they put money down for your project, they're going to expect to get their money back. All the CEO, the CEO respected me because I put out projects previously before joining them. Kevin Luciano, he said one thing to me. He said, please, Mode 9, please record an album that I can sell. And that's all he said to me. He didn't put any extra pressure. He didn't do a dance track, do this, do that. And that's why I had one of the best albums, one of the best hip hop albums that came out at that time, because I wasn't under any pressure to do any commercial shit. And that's what the whole industry was using against me. They was like, oh nine, go commercial. They were always saying it, go commercial, go commercial, go, that was the, everything, Everywhere I go, there was like, are you ever going to go commercial? Then I asked them, define commercial, define commerce. Commerce is the art of buying and selling. Now, if I put out this album and I sell two copies, what have I just done? It's commercial already, man. It just depends on how you look at it. If I take the most underground song and I shoot a video, put the guy on the golden throne with 20 half-dressed 
babes around him dancing and whining to his underground hip hop and shoot it with a very high uh, level camera. Have Hype Williams even shoot it, have waterfalls and John Woo birds flying <laughs> around. And have it. Like, okay. The most hardcore grimy this thing, everybody, MTV will play it, heavy rotation. It's just what you put mm. in it. Like, is that, that's just how you promote it. It's the promotion. If you have money to promote an underground song, it will blow up. People will hear it. And guess what they say? If you hear mm. a song five times a day, you will end up liking it. You won't know. It's going to be an airworm. It's going to play in your head. We've all so, been there. We've all been there. Said, some shit you don't. Even, some shit you don't even like. You hear it gets stuck in your fucking head all day. <laughs> you start thinking it. You start singing it, man. Like reason for him to switch to I'm a piano. I know it gets. It gets really the pressure when you listen to people around you, and you need. You badly need some money. Oh, man, there's a serious pressure that will just make you do it. So I don't blame him for doing it. It's different country different pressure. My my own Nigeria, they didn't even want to hear me when I was doing my hip hop. My last album I dropped before mm-hmm. I left Nigeria, guys are telling me, like, you're still on this hip hop thing. They're telling me, you're still on this hip hop thing. You better do some commercial rap man, before we can bring you. This one, nobody's going to buy this. So that's what they told me. But I was like, man, I, I'd rather my name to be intact, my status, instead of doing one dance. What happens if I do the dance album and it doesn't sell? <laughs> seppuku that's what the japanese will call it man. harakiri that is equal to seppuku yeah <laughs> i'm telling okay. you that, that is it so no, i didn't want to find out well you had you have the history so i, I learned like today like I, you have the history of of making dance hall records and you yeah. have an interest you have an interest in reggaeton right so yeah. like so why not Afro beats? Is it literally just you don't like, you don't enjoy the sound? Uh, I don't really like reggaeton. Some of it is good. If your name is Daddy Yankee or Daddy Puerto Grande, is good. But if your name is Mo Nine doing reggaeton, no, that's like Nori doing reggaeton, man. He got back. <laughs> <after that. laughs> I don't hate Afro beats, contrary to what people say. I'm actually one of the first rappers that use Afro beats. To make hip hop, mm. I do not hate Afro beats. I actually vibe to Burner Boy a lot, more than a little bit. Yeah, I like Burner Boy. Some whiskey, Udre Legba, that's my joint. Come on, what, what are they say? A lot of people say I don't like Afro beat. No, I said on that my track, I don't really rock. Really, I said really. I don't really. That means I don't be doing it all the time. Like some of it is cool. There's a guy called Banky W. He makes good music too. Um, there's a another guy, Flavor, Flavor Nabania. I think that's his name from the East. He too makes good music. He has some really good, cool tracks, man. Uh, this CK, CK, Love One Tin Tin. That is a jam, a jam and a half. Then there's one song. I don't really feel the reason bad things anymore, Georgia. I forgot who said that song, but man, I remember the first time I, saw, I I heard the song, they were doing one challenge where they'll be throwing drinks on everybody. But the song is what I was like, wow, it's just a different vibe. That was a di- I love I love that song. Do you know what? Sometimes I'll be on YouTube playing that song on my phone on YouTube. If I put, if I put wait, 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 fire. I need to prove it because a lot of people will be acting like I'm lying. Now, if I'm lying, I'm flying. Mm. No reason bad things anymore. Uh, I've forgotten the name of that song. Uh, 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 but uh, yeah, the guy's name is Joe Boy. Okay. You can see. You can see that. I already started listening to it. I listened to it over and over again, but I already started listening. You see that he has already have shown signs of me listening to it. I'll watch the video. Mm. I want to get the call. I see my alcohol. Oh, 
that song, let me tell you, right? When I first heard that song, I was like, it was on the challenge and it was just the hook. I was like, man, this is nice. So I went to go and look for who, I was like, who did this song, Joe Boy? Then I watched the video and I was like, man, this is nice. I played it, I, I, I watched this thing more than 10 times. Repeat, repeat, repeat. That one and there's another one, Love One Team Team. That is another fire song. And there's so many songs like that. Uh, so many, like from different artists. The only problem I have is the the new guys. Some of the new guys, when they try to make their music, they try to sound exactly like the people that are already there. Sometimes you can't tell who is who. Like mm. for people to say Modai doesn't like Afrobeat, that's a lie. David O, ask David O about me, man. I went to David O's house early. I was one. I'm one of the few guys that showed David O love when he was coming up. That's fine. Oh, many people don't know that. Many people don't know that. I showed David O, and David O confirmed it. He confirmed it on his life. So I don't need to prove anything. Two Face is my guy. Two Face. What does Two Face? What Two Face does? We used to call it Afro Pop. That's what it really is. My own problem is the name. There's Afrobeat. Now you need to understand there's Afrobeat. That is Fela Kuti, right? And Sheon Kuti. That's the bam, 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 da, 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 the heavy horns, like, like an orchestra, African orchestra. That is Afrobeat. Then somebody, I don't know who, maybe someone based in London now, decided to call our Afro pop Afrobeats with an S. So that got me thinking, I was like, come on, bro. We already have mm. Afrobeat. Why are you putting an S? Yeah. It's like me saying I'm, putting my, I'm doing my own genre of hip hop and I'm calling it hip hops, but it's not hip hop. It's different, you know. It, it, it it's right. actually Afro pop. So that's my whole argument with the whole thing. Not the music. The music, of course, some of it is fire. Like this Joe Boy, CK, Two Face, uh, Burner Boy, Wiz Kid. Um, who else again? There's so many others, man. There's so many. There's, there's so many. There's a lot. There's, yo, there's so many Come talented on. artists, though. Like, like I, I, would, I would never ask you to 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 be on the spot and name every single person that you fuck with. There's, there's too so many. many of them. There's too They're many cats good. that are that are good that are like They're make actually music, dope man. music. I started doing dance hall. Now, if I do dance hall, come on, man! Don't you think that I, this Afro piece that they're doing now, the type that you know, this love wanted to kind of be. I could easily do a dance hall remix, easily. But you see, I'm not a cloud chaser. I don't be, the reason why I have my respect intact is I don't be jumping on everything that, is, that people perceive as hot. I don't be huh? jumping to do a quick remix just to get my name. No, I do this mm. music for a reason. And that reason is it's therapeutic. It is just to make me feel good and to make those fans that have felt me from day one, feel good. If I can make my day one fan feel good, I'm blessed. Because the worst thing that you can do is to switch up so badly that your fans from day ones will be like, man, I used to like that guy. He fell off. That's the worst thing that can happen to you as an artist. And then the new fans that you're trying to cater to, they'll be like, nah, he used to go for this shit. <laughs> We know when he was wearing baggy jeans, man. I was in first year when he was wearing his baggy jeans. <laughs> ain't working. And then guess what? You're stuck in the middle with no fans. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, that's a... I, I am very satisfied with that perspective and that explanation of everything. I feel like that's well thought out. I feel like you you articulated your points very, very well. Um, I, I, don't see, I don't see how anybody could twist that into a negative... You know what I mean? I like, like, like. There are people who who are what we call willfully ignorant. People who just yeah. look look for ways to oh, kind of man, manipulate a narrative, right? So, like, I I appreciate you taking the time to to go and, and fully dissect that. Yes. Now, I I have some questions if you don't mind uh, from Twitter. So I put up. I was like, hey, I have a chance. I'm going to be sitting down with my guy. Is there any questions? Like, what type of things do we have to go over? Uh, I have a couple of them. Uh, if you don't mind, if I hit you with it real no, quick, all mind. right. All right, let's, let's look. Uh, so this was a good one, and this is one that I actually want to know myself. Uh, in your own words, and not because like we, I hear about you a lot. I hear about Mode Nine from a lot of sources. In your own words, what would you say is your legacy, or what do you want your legacy to be? 
in your own words? My own words? Yeah. The guy that was just himself. The true Gemini. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Sometimes hot, sometimes cold. But all the time, real. I fuck with it. Okay. Keep it simple. Um, we have an, uh, another one. Remy asks, uh, what advice do you have for the younglings that are aspiring to be like you in the hip-hop space? First of all, uh, it's not going to be... I'll say to be like me shouldn't be the way you should try to, you know, do it. Because when I came up, we didn't have any of this. Uh, we didn't have Twitter. We didn't have we didn't have nothing when we had to grind, we had to work. I wouldn't want my enemy to go through what I went through. It was really difficult. It can make you go crazy. It can affect your mental health. So I'll just tell you, right? All you have to do is to build with what you already have and continue doing what you have to do. Do not allow friends. Friends will be the ones and family. They'll be the ones to make sure you do not succeed at the end of the day. You have to find out what you want to do, concentrate on what you want to do, and make sure you don't stop doing it until you're successful. And that's it. Like To be like me, like back then, it was a whole different ball game. But right now, I believe that you have the world at your feet. You can do anything you want to do. You could even trend worldwide on Twitter right now. But you make sure you focus and work on your craft before you start putting out music. If you want to be a, a rapper, focus on your craft. Make sure you got information. Make sure you, you got the lyrics, the content, the right beats. You have to learn about music. You have to listen to old school shit, shit that you, I mean, I came up like, I'm more um, conversant with 90s hip hop. But when I was coming up, you know, trying to do this rap thing, I went back to the 80s and the 70s to listen, to watch Wild Style, watch all the movies, Boogie, Electric Boogaloo. Tried to, I tried to like study the whole art form over again because you will never know your future. You have to know your past before you can start concentrating on the present and the future. So go back to the past and learn about the art form. You have to know it. That's it. Let's go. Um, what motivates you to make an album using a single producer? Because you've had several albums where there's there's not a variety, but you have one person that's putting it all together. And you did it. You've already told us, you know, like the situation with the, the Germany thing and how that was broken up and stuff. But like, is, is there is there anything you would like to elaborate on with that? Yeah. Do you know what? There are certain producers that I just like their sound. And yes, I like taking different beats from different producers every now and then, you know, to make an album. Most of my albums have been like that, just different beats from different producers. But I realized one thing, there's more uh, synergy, more like it, it just, to, for me, it's a whole vibe when the producer just sends you a batch of beats and you listen to the beats and you start trying to create stuff. And it's just one producer, so you just don't, you just know that everything is going to be solid I just like that one producer thing. I don't know. I think it's just for me paying attention to a uh, cruise like Little Brother, where Ninth Wonder used to produce all their stuff. I, I used to love, I used to love Ninth Wonder's beats. I still do. I still love his beats. I remember going to producer Jonah the Monarch back in 2005 when I was signed to Question Mark. And I said, I need beats. He played me 60 beats. I rejected all 60. He played me 60. And I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> and he now told me come back on Monday so on the Monday I came back he only played two beats and I loved those two beats and after recording those and putting them on my album with question mark I went back to him and I just said I think we can do a project now now that you know what I like first of all it has to be a producer that knows what I'm very picky with beats there's certain way my beats have to go they're not going like two bar loops from the beginning to the end. I don't do that. I don't like that. It just has to change. Something has to change inside the verse or maybe the chorus has to be distinct from the verse. The verse, the beat in the verse cannot be the same beat in the chorus. I wouldn't like that. 
So once a producer can get past that, knows what I like, I think he can make beats for me. And Texilla, he did a good job. Craft, with the first producer that I did a whole producer rapper thing with, was a producer called Craft. Okay, there's one, my first album ever, was produced by a guy called The Capo, but later on, G-Links now produced some tracks. So I can say Craft, Nigel Ben's Craft work, that was 2007. And that was fire. That was fire. It was called the Soul Edition. So my AKA is Nigel Ben, the Dark Destroyer. I named myself after the bo after the boxer Nigel Ben, the Dark Destroyer. So I just called myself Nigel Ben. Was that the that was the one? What that the, the the Nigerian Nightmare? Uh, no, no, that that's Kamaru Usman, the Nigerian Nightmare. This is Nigel oh. Ben. Nigel gotcha. Ben is I, a no, when I was listening to the to the to the to the we did the special and that joke came on, I was like, yo, that's a hard ass nickname. <laughs> yeah. Um so let me see this uh, while we're on the producer tip. Um with you wanting to make that 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 like like more solidified transition into being a producer yourself, like who do you do you have like an inspiration? Are there like certain producers right now where you're like you look up to in the space that you want to ascend to? Yeah. Oh, by the way. You know, Craft uh, once lived with me, a producer in Nigeria called Craft. He stayed in my crib. We were doing some work together. He was a very good guy, easygoing guy. He was production. He actually started off my first studio, and he produced all my beats in the first studio. Craft was a very good producer because he used to study. He used to buy this magazine called Scratch Magazine. It's defunct now. They don't sell it anymore. It was a producer magazine. So we used to buy Scratch magazine. We used to study it, read it. And I wasn't really, I produced, I used to dabble you know, Fruity Loops every now and then, but I never called myself a producer. Well, Kraft was the main guy, man. And he was recording for, uh, sampling from vinyl, doing all that shit, that producer shit. <laughs> so he was one person that really inspired me, that made me feel like, yo, sometimes I make a beat playfully and you'll be like, man, that's it, that's it. So Kraft, number one, I'll say Kraft. Then Jonah, these are all guys in Nigeria. Jonah the Monarch, that's the guy I did a project with too. Like Jonah too, is these beats are always clean. I just watching Jonah work just made me feel like, yeah, you know what? I should double into this. Jonah, Kraft, and then G Links was the first guy that blew my mind when I first Nigerian producer that blew my mind. He just came back from South Africa and produced, it's about to get ugly. I was like, shit. So G Links is like, I call him the father of Nigerian real hip hop production. And then um Mr. Baron. Mr. Baron was part of SWAT Root. He was doing all our production. These are these guys all uh inspired me because I'll sit down and watch Mr. Baron produce. And I was like, he's always saying it. Baron always had one philosophy. He said, no beat is soft or hard until it is wrapped over. You can make a very soft beat. Ding 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 ding. Ding 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 ding. Remember the Mob Deep song with Cool G rap? Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding. If you just play that shit just without the vocals, you without like, huh? context, yeah. But once Cool G rap jumped on that shit, that shit became harder <laughs> to know, man. So yeah, those those guys inspired me. Those Nigerian producers, Texilla too. We can't, we can't, we we can't leave out Texilla. But my the producers. From America, that inspired me. Number one, it has to be DJ Premier. Pete Rock. For a long time, I just used to sit down and listen to instrumentals. Pete Rock, DJ Premier. I also, I liked Dre. But, yeah, Dr. Dre should be there, man, because Dr. Dre really, really messed my head up with a lot of his production. And Ninth Wonder. Ninth Wonder is also... That I think my, my ninth wonder era, like if you're making a beat for me, I will tell you, make it like ninth wonder. I was just saying, make it soulful like ninth wonder. And then let's not forget Kanye West because there's a time Kanye West production of Blueprint, that shit blew me away. I remember walking around in a, with my backpack with my Blueprint CD. <laughs> oh, I'm like, damn, I'll just take the CD out, put this on my Walkman, my Discman, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I'm like, damn. I was like, I used to call him Kane West. I didn't know it was Kanye. I just, maybe I wasn't reading it properly. 
Kanye West. Kanye West. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kanye West was is really fire. It was fire. Yeah. If anyone takes, dog, if anyone takes anything away from this interview, I hope it's, I hope it's this genuine energy and fucking love that you have for the craft. Because like, this is, I feel like this is how every interview I do with an artist should be. I feel, you know what I mean? Like if I'm not getting this type of feedback, like you can't be that, you can't be that in it. Like this is dog. like you, this is, this is fire. I, I hope that they see that, especially because like, we started off. I did, like I said, by doing the research. I'm like, yo, it's this is saying like he's a little standoffish with the interviews and stuff. Like I was, I wasn't expecting to be smiling and laughing and you know what I mean, like reminiscent of fucking our hip hop bags and shit like that. Like, Doug, this is this is different, man. This is fire. Uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people. Do you know what? Let me tell you something about. Uh, I won't say Nigeria, like just human beings in general. If you go to a place, right, go to an event and everything, and you're all smiley and everything, people will take that as you being weak, you being easily, like, approachable. They'll just approach you and disrespect you. Like, you won't want to throw paws at people. Like, you won't you won't want to prove yourself. You won't want you and your homeboys against the scuffle or anything. So the best thing that this happens to most Nigerian artists, most artists, not even Nigerian artists, you get into a place, straight face. Straight face. You know, and then people will just know that okay, he ain't playing. You know, so a lot of people they just go like this age where the internet age where someone will just walk up to you, do some fuckboy shit just so that they can get they can film it and trend. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, you have to make sure you're aware of your surroundings at all times, protect yourself at all times. It it's a fight. That's what it is, man. But you have to protect yourself. So you can't just be going around smiling, happy. We are together. Listen, somebody's going to oh, smack yeah. you in the face, man, just for clout. So <laughs> you just have to, like, most of the time, I'm careful. And I'm careful with people I don't know. If I do my research on you, okay, okay, this is what he's about. All right, all right, all right. Ah, uh, okay, nice, nice. Okay, cool. This guy's certified. Then I can let my guard down. But if I... Don't know you, don't do any nothing about you, and then you just come start asking questions and everything. I'll be like, man, who the fuck is this? I always go and check. But when you're outside, there's no way for you to check. So the right. only thing is just keep to yourself. Just, just play well. Well shit. I, I appreciate but, you being comfortable enough to to let loose and, and like really give me the real you in this interview. That means a lot, Doug. That means a lot. Yeah, this is me. Like me. Well, do you know one funny thing? We used to call it where we used to live in Abuja. <laughs> The payback house, yeah, because we're signed to payback time records, you know. So we used to live in a place called Josh Street, Area Three. Look, the, listen, the guys in that house were all clowns. All we did all day was make music <laughs> and joke around, just be playing the dozens on each other, just be joking around. That look, like chicks will come over to the crib and say, "I'm like." I didn't know you guys were like this. You guys outside in your videos, you guys, <laughs> you guys are actually clowns. We we were clowns. Me, Terry the Rap Man, OD. OD is another guy that if you see him outside, he's, his face is always dull and he's like, he's more reserved. And but inside the house, we're all just making just making noise, jumping up and down. So many times the neighbors have come. It's like, you guys are making too much noise. <laughs> we're having fun. It was all fun and games, man. Like, but I noticed that when you are just when you let your guard down, you're happy, you're doing, you know, people will just come and disrespect you. Always. It always happens, man. Especially sadly, my country, like there's several times I went somewhere, I probably went dolo or with one person, and then somebody will come and step to me and just say some bullshit, man. I'll be like, get the fuck out of my face. You know, I'm not actually a small guy, so Sometimes they just leave, but sometimes they want to, you know. But for for just for the flimsiest things, man, just ask you. So one guy just comes up to me and just say, "Yeah, oh nine, that your last track you did. I didn't like it." And I'm looking at him. So what you gonna do about it? I was like, "So what you gonna do? Or what do you want me to say? What do you want to do?" He said, "No, no, no. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan." And like I don't know. They just try to do, do some shit mm. to trigger you, but me. It's all love for me, but you know when people behave like that, man, I don't. I got so you. Much, man, my my demeanor is kind of like you know. Uh, 
and they no, get the I feel you, dog. It's I'm glad oh, that I we never. Can... One more thing. Yeah. Never. If you're an artist and somebody wants a picture with you, they never say no. I've only said no twice, I think. And that was two times I remember saying no. Do you know why? And I'll explain myself. Tell me. So I'm on stage, right, performing, and I'm struggling because I need to take a pee. I need to take a pee, and I'm on stage struggling. I even remove one song out of my songs that I'm supposed to perform and jump to the main song, perform the song, and I'm struggling. After I perform the song, I run backstage. So there's this guy with like three chicks. He said, Mugnan, can you take a picture? They didn't understand that at that point in time, I was about to... <laughs> I just said, no, yo, I'll, I'll be back, I'll be back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. So I ran, brrr, go to the toilet. Ah. Then I come back. Then I see the guy with the girls. I said, okay, yeah. Then the guy just said, I don't know why you people are acting like you know, you're too much. I don't want to take the picture again. I said, like, okay. I just walked away. That's what happened. <laughs> but even these girls, they'll feel that I was being an asshole. But I needed to take mm -hmm. that peek, that moment. I need it to I, I hope I hope that person sees this. I hope I hope that person sees this interview and sees the recap of that story, and we get that comment. That comment was like, "I've been mad about this for ten years." Like <laughs> that shit was funny, man. That shit was so funny, man. Because I was like, "Okay, <laughs> let me go, man. Okay, man. There's nothing I can say to him, man. He was already pissed off. So I was like, oh, okay. So that's the only time I didn't take picture." Oh, yeah, yeah. There was another time. It was still after a show. Yeah. So a guy had told me before I go on, I want to take a picture with you backstage. I want to take a picture with you backstage. And I was like, okay, okay, cool. Let me perform first. I performed. Immediately I finished. The reporters, they just dragged me. The guy was saying, let me take the picture. They just dragged me away. And then the guys that worked for the label were like, no, 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 no. And I was like, I was, I was telling the guy, come back later. Come back. So after they did all the interviews and everything, I went out looking for the guy. I didn't see him. And I was like, oh, man, what a shame. And then later, when we we're leaving the venue, I saw the guy outside. The guy just said, oh, move up. I said, let's take that picture now. Then. But this guy was more to just say, oh, thank God, I waited for this. And he took the picture. So those are the only two times I, went, I wasn't able to take the picture immediately. But apart from that, I tried to take the picture because you don't know. These guys might probably be your fans for like ages. And then you say no because you're tired, because you're sweating, because... Leave all that shit. You can be sweating, no problem. That's why I carry a towel anytime I go on stage, wipe my face off, and take the picture. Respect, dog. Uh, yeah. Last, last thing. Let, let me let me get to this. Then um, this came about. Uh, I had my interview with Mi Baga, and I yeah, asked yeah. him a question, and yeah. I was like, I was like, yo, what what do I need to do? to like, what's, what's the next thing that I could do to better like tap into the scene, right? And he said like, you gotta go, you have to listen to Mode 9. He said, you have to go and you have to listen to Mode 9. Mode 9, you know the- Am I, am I, I'm warning you. <laughs> you know what? Am I could be regarded as the nicest guy in hip hop. The guy. Do you know what? Let me tell you something. When it comes to, uh, um, this is no cap. Uh, Thank you, MI, for the referral. Thank you very much. But right now, when it comes to Nigerian hip-hop, MI is more in tune with what's going on. He has the businesses that are even promoting the battle rap. He has the industry guys, the agencies and everything. He's in bed with them. He knows these agency guys, the guys that can make things happen. Me, I'm just here. I'm over here in London. I'm, I've been far removed from the scene. So in order to make hip hop better, this is I'm just I'm no cap. I'm just, I'm speaking seriously now for in Nigeria. In order to make hip hop better, is for Mi to use his resources, which he's already doing in a way with the battle rap. You should do more. Talk to more of these companies. There was a day that um Mi and Ice Prince they did a show in Joss. They invited me. I think me, Rugged Man, and uh, <clears throat> I think Ferocious or so. So we all went to Joss to do a show, Jesus Christ. That was massive, massive. I was talking to Ice Prince after the whole thing. Even MI, I was like, man, we should we should make this thing a, a thing where we go to different towns to go and do this because the love was, Joss, Joss was crazy. There's an old song that I did called Elbow Room. So I'm performing it, right? 
And before I get to the chorus, Jeremiah again, as the guy that did the hook, but he's like a gospel artist and he never came out as the guy that did the hook. He just jumps on stage and grabs the mic for me and he starts singing the hook. <laughs> and for me to even do the second verse, Ice Prince grabs the mic for me and does it. Man, look, that was one of the my most favorite, that's one of the favorite <laughs> shows ever. It was all, everybody was like, and this was organized by them, M.I. and Ice Prince. So I believe they can they can do something because all these industry guys, all these companies, and so they they need to jump on this. Like we talked about this then, that was 2016. We talked we talked about it. Get these guys to invest. If the footage of that, I think they have the footage. If they show these the footage to all these guys, these guys would definitely put money down and say, okay, let's have a hip hop concert every every year to better hip hop in Nigeria. If they use what they have to get what they want. If they go in on it without that, just all ego aside for some of the, the guys that are about to put some money or so the guys that are going to just help doing some other stuff behind the scene, everybody just work as one. Trust me. Trust me, it will work out 100% because we are not Afrobeat artists, we're hip hop artists. Now, some of the rappers now have to start doing Afrobeat songs to pop. I don't blame them because it's where we're from. And in order for you to eat, you have to do that because they're gonna bring KRS One to Nigeria, and they're still gonna they're still gonna put Afrobeat artists there because they say those are the people that that the people want to see. Wow. Even if they bring a KRS One, even if they bring a Kendrick Lamar, they will still put Tiwa Savage and all the Afrobeat singers there. So I understand fully. It's very it's gonna be very difficult for us to do it, but it's possible. From that one show that we all did in Joss. That's what made me, before I didn't believe, I was like, man, this shit ain't that. But we did that one show, and I was like, it can happen. It can happen. How many of us performed? Bruce Canaan, me, I think Ferocious performed. Uh, am I, Jesse, no, I don't know if Jesse Jack was, I, think, was, I don't know if it was there, but yeah, Ice Prince. Who are too many, Rugged Man. Yeah, weren't all that many. Most Nigerian shows that they do big shows, they, they have like 20 people performing. This one, we don't even need 10 performers. We don't need 10. Eight people, five people could do a, a successful show. I'm sure that five solid artists, hip hop heads, not just right. singers, that like hip hop add vector to the mix, you know, all these guys. Five people can do a show and these get promoted very well. Have TV, have radio, have the internet. If you get all this shit locked in, trust me, hip hop will be back in Nigeria full time. Man, so I, that was way better than the question I had lined up. All right, let's go, my guy. <laughs> you know, no respect to MI, but I'm way over here, man. I'm, I'm far removed from what's going on over there. Trust me, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> But respect Fair for enough. that man, my referral, man. Thank you very much. Fair enough. So the my my question was just gonna be who would you refer if you were to tell me to go and tap in with a new artist uh that that I may not be familiar with, who would you recommend me to tap into? Uh this guy's not a new artist. But he's one of the most incredible artists I know. One of my favorite rappers. I don't know if you already know him, but he's he's like a legend too. His name is Terry the Rap Man. You need to tap in with Terry. He's okay, a vampire. So I know the name, but I have not tapped in yet. So I'll, I'll start looking into that then. Yeah. Tap into Terry. Oh, Six Foot Plus. Six Foot Plus, I don't know if he has dropped anything new, but Six Foot Plus is somebody that it, when it comes to talking, about his journey like to me let me not let me not lie to you let me just say this i put this out there the best performer the best hip-hop slash uh, what, what would i call it he's just hip-hop slash uh traditional music performer ever in nigeria in short the best performer when it comes to hip-hop ever Let's go. Six foot plus. Six foot plus. Do you know why? 
we were in the same uh, <laughs> we're in the same uh, label, right? Anytime we right. go out for a show, I make sure I perform before him. <laughs> because I'm going on stage with a DJ, you know, DJ is playing and I'm just rapping, I'm just rapping, it's raw energy, more rap. Six foot plus travels with a drama troupe. He had one song, one gay. Oh, oh, they had the, they, they wear their black and white, and they do the, they do their TV is a TV a TIV. Uh, they're from the middle belt of Nigeria. They have a dance that they do. They do the dance, and then he's gonna be rapping. It's from the native dun, 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 from the vessels of Nigeria, dun, dun. and then they're gonna do the dance and everything. Like it's like a drama troupe. Like he studied theater. He studied theater, so hell, he should be good at this. <laughs> like he brings us all. This is a guy that can. If they do like kind of like a, a, a kind of hip hop cultural, a hip hop show in Brooklyn for all those mm -hmm. uh, the whole taps, the woke kind of you know with the dreadlocks and the bees right. and everything. They do. If they ever do a concert for people that are like are like that, and Six Who Boss performs, it's all over. Do you know what used to happen <laughs> when this guy? If this guy should finish his performance. Ain't nobody going to want to see nobody with the mic again. <laughs> nobody. Nobody want to see you touch a mic. You're rapping. What the fuck are you rapping about? When <laughs> Six Foot Plus is giving you a whole drama show, he gone change his clothes. He has, oh, man, Six Foot Plus, man. There's a song that he has called, He Don't Do Me. Oh, like, like. He told story, a story about a, a, a woman, a girl that was like, um, I think she was uh, harassed by her boss or something like. Like, listen, I traveled. I've traveled with six, uh, on several shows, right? That Six Foot Plus has had. I was like, it's kind of like his roadie, like whole things. Together. I don't mind digging in and doing this. Thing. Like, I've not always been more than the legend. I was more than the roadie, holding things, carrying things, you know, moving things in here and there for Six Foot Plus, you know. But he's he was same label, but his album came out before ours. So we were just. It was like a family. We're all putting in that work, putting in that shift for six. We'll go do a little performance, then six will now end the show. Look, nobody should try to perform after six foot plus. The show ends because that's the end. He brings it up, crescendo, climax, bam! And that's it. <laughs> the DJ is literally Let's packing that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but trust me, six foot plus. I'm a, I'm a... I'm going to turn it to the GS gang in the comments. You guys made it this far. Uh, let me know which songs do you guys want to see me tap into on the channel from Six Foot Plus and from Terry the Rap Man. Put it down in the comments. Let me know. I'll see I'll see what people uh, tap into. Uh, before I get you out of here, my guy, is there any questions you have for me or the GS gang? Anything that you want to want to turn and point back to us before I get you out of here? I don't really have a question. I, I just really uh, want to thank you for doing what you're doing, man. For a long time, that, Nigerians have been looking for, you know, they've been looking for people outside Nigeria. They, they, we've been just flying blind a lot of times. We're like, a lot of people have been flying blind. They don't know if anybody's looking at them. We're like, we don't know what's happening out there. We don't know if anybody's appreciating what we're doing. We're just doing it off the fly. <laughs> but seeing you comment, I saw you interviewing Eva, and I was like, wow. Wow, this guy gets around, man. How who the fuck is this guy, man? How the fuck did this guy tap in? Uh, yes, when it comes to this shit, man, you're on it, man. You keep on doing what you're doing, man. And only big things coming, man. We all know it. Everybody knows it. All the people you've interviewed, they know they know it. If another guy comes in and starts doing, try to sweat the technique, copy the format, we know who did it first. I appreciate that. That's heavy. Look, I'm going to give you some exclusive info then uh, uh, because you said that about like, um, you know, people like uh, wondering whether or not outsiders are tapping in and stuff like that. One of my big things that I'm working on right now is I want to I want to help grow out a reactor from every country that I tap into and create a network. So that when I go and react to something, if mode nine drops, right, and I react to it, I also have somebody in Nigeria reacting to it. There's also someone in Ghana reacting to it. There's also somebody in South Africa reacting to it and create that GS gang network for when there's something that's that good that we want to put out, that we can get it out to all these different countries at the same time. 
and create something like that. And I was talking about that today. I put it out. I, I was tweeting. I was like, yo, I want to, I'm thinking about ways to give back and I'm probably not big enough for it yet. Cause you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm still growing myself, but when mm-hmm. I get there, dog, I, I have, mm-hmm. I have ideas and I have plans set up that I think could really make a difference in the future, man. You, so you get there hundred percent. Like, like, listen, we have one thing that Nigerians have is the population. We got people behind us, and you tapping in, doing interviews with people like Mi, and these guys obviously they have a lot of followers. Vector, another person that you, I don't know if he's interviewed Vector, but you need to look for that dude. Uh, I think that Vector is one of those situations where I never had any interaction with him, but like his fans don't really fuck with me because I haven't fucked with the music that I've reacted to. People are people get very defensive when I'm not a huge fan of somebody right off the bat. Like it takes me time. Like 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 at, like 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 take any any artist whatsoever. If yeah. I'm not instantly a fan and they have um, like Vector is one of these people who like his fans are very polarizing. Right, like he, he, they, they're like mm-hmm. you. If you don't say he's the greatest in the world, then yeah. they're automatically label you a hater. And I, I try to distinguish this, right? Mm. Disliking someone and and disliking like an uh, a track or a record versus hating on yeah. something. If I dislike something, it's because it's not for me. Not everything is for everybody. Not every person is gonna like every track. That's not hating. Hating is, is when you probably- do like something and mm-hmm. you still dislike it because of yeah. who. Who, where it comes from, you know what I mean? And I try maybe, to teach people that. Maybe you weren't really vibing with that one track, but I'm sure if you listen to a lot more of his tracks, man, Vector has, he has several dope tracks. Trust me, he has several dope tracks. So you need to just, you know, listen to more, listen to more tracks, you know. You get so definitely there's something that will tickle your fancy. I, I'm, a, I, I'm actually on one of his tracks, and he's actually on one of my tracks, and he's fantastic. He's a phenomenal rapper, man. But and it's look, all good, to, man. Like, to hear yeah. people to hear people say positive things about someone, even if I don't necessarily click with them, I would never discredit somebody. I would yeah. never take like like even like if I listen to a song and I'm like, man, I hate this, and some and like people in the GS gang, like like Doug, my my fan base has no problem telling me that I'm fucking wrong, and have no problem telling me to shut the fuck. Like like I I open the conversation. Every reaction yeah. I do, I end with, do you agree or do you disagree? Because it's yeah. I'm the only one opinion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't ever, I don't ever overestimate the value of my one voice. We are a collective. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the idea is to to bounce that off of each other. So yeah, I'm sure you're right. There's there's something out there. I'm but sure I, I'll, I still, I'll connect with. I still I still feel that that interview with Vector is needed because he's one of those pivotal points when it comes to uh, Nigerian hip hop at this moment. Yeah. So that interview with Vector, yes, that will be very important. Mi mm-hmm. too. I know you probably have done Mi. I think. Yeah. Mi. Will be very important. Eva, uh, you did Eva, well, yeah, which is okay. One of one of our best female MCs. We also have some other female MCs. There's a girl, but she's based here in London. Her name is Flo. She's actually Texilla's girl. She is fire, straight fire. I've I've um, seen her on the the ciphers before. On the I think I think it was the Hennessy cipher. She was Flo bloody that dope. shit. <laughs> Flo yeah. is dope. My Flo is dope. So there are a lot of people that you know. Just bit by just one by one tapping tapping bit by bit, you know. I I think I really think you really need to do Vector's interview because you know if you got me there, you got Emma, you got Vector, you got Jesse Jacks, you got Tevin the Rap Man, Six Foot Plus. You got the whole rap. You got the whole rap industry, man. You also get a guy called Boogie. That's one of the underground kings. Boogie, in Boogie's my guy. So. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of Boogie. Uh, I think Boogie's yes. incredible. I love his music. I love him as a person. He's he's a super dope guy. I when I reached out to him uh, for an interview was right before he he took a step back from the scene. He's kind of been off the radar for a little while right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and like his the way that he worded it was basically like, when the time comes, if it's right, you know what I'm saying it'll happen when uh, when it's supposed to happen type thing. You know what I mean? Over. It's yeah, over, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's going through something, man. You know. Yeah. So love, so nothing but love to everybody involved. Look, I, I will do my due diligence. I'll reach out to Vec. I'll do. I, I'll listen to the music first. To. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'll reach out. And if it happens, it happens. I'm down for it. You know what I mean? It's definitely not something yeah. I'm against. And also, there's a guy I don't know if you've uh, heard of LD the Don. No, I don't know. LD the Don is one of the pioneers for this. Let me tell you something about LD the Don quickly. 
my first email address, monanayahoo.com, which was hacked a couple of like a couple of years ago. I don't know who did that. But my first email address ever, LD opened that shit for me. <laughs> LD opened that shit for me, man. I didn't know shit. I saw them on cyber. I said, what the fuck are you guys doing? Like, I said, email address. Wait, we're just sending emails. I said, what? Then he asked me, do you have an email address? I was like, no. <laughs> then he said, I can open one for you. I was like, for real? I was like, yeah. And then we, that my first email address was opened by LD. That was in, I think, 1999 or something like that. Shit. It was crazy, man. I, I didn't know what the fuck email address was. I was like, what are you doing? So I'm sending emails. I was like, fuck. So look, yeah, now, you're, now you're producing. It's like, come on, look, look how far we've come. <laughs> I, was like, L. I was like, LD. Thank you very much for opening my first. I'm sure he has forgotten, but yeah, this is a reminder. You did that. You did that. <laughs> right. So you need to talk about LD. We can't talk about Nigerian hip hop without talking about LD and the tribesmen. They're very important. Very important to the journey. Look, remedies, even yeah. though a lot of people will argue that, oh, they're not really about, listen, remedies, tribesmen, SWAT root, Rough, rugged, and raw. Death Oak Clan. Those were the crews back then. Trust me, these guys all went through hell. They went through hell. And LD was way ahead of his time. Way ahead. He was already doing message boards, blogs, websites, and shit before anybody was doing nada. LD was there doing that shit. Payback time, the label I was on, they had a website. And we got a lot of fans on our website too. So hey. Oh man. man. We've come a long way, man. But you need to talk to LD too. LD's in Atlanta somewhere, he's in America. But you need to find a way to talk to him. And also, oh. if you haven't talked to Ilbliss, just talk to Ilbliss too. Because these guys, they have remarkable stories, man. I'm I can tell you they have a lot of stories. LD could tell you stories for days. He's a good storyteller. I will be doing my due diligence and tapping in, my guy. Look, I want to thank you for taking the con time to to come chop it up with me. This has been this has been way, way, way bigger and better than I even thought that it could be. I'm really glad that my perception and, and preconceived notions uh, that may have been coming into this, you know, what I'm saying, were ill advised, and that you, you know, what I'm saying, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying that we we were able to have such a dope, free, open conversation. Doug, I'm telling you, when I start reading that stuff, I'm like, man, he's like, I hate lazy interview questions. I was like, we gotta delete all this shit. All right, we gotta start again. We gotta start again. All right, we gotta take a different different route here, man. <laughs> I don't know who said that. None of these questions have been lazy, man. It was just when I was going to events and they were asking me the same questions over and over again. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? I'm like, oh, shit, that question again. <laughs> and I have it already rehearsed in my head. I got it. I got the answer rehearsed. I just say it with no emotion, like, uh, uh, what's this guy's name? Dynamite, whatever. Napoleon Dynamite. I just say it like Napoleon Dynamite. I just say it with no emotions. I say, yeah, I see myself owning a label, putting our young artists out, helping a lot of people to flow. Whatever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this this was pretty cool as well. I don't do many interviews. I don't do many interviews. But if it's important, I'll do it. And this one, from the way everything, you know, the whole thing was set up, I knew it was important. See, in about five and a half hours, I gotta be up for work. So have a good night, my guy. I appreciate your time. As always, yeah. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. I will catch y'all on the next one. Let's bless, go. One. bless, 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 man.